Si fa più male. Mi piace il grazie. Eh, mi piace. Mi piace. Mi piace. Mi ci conosciamo perché sono già le tre e poi abbiamo una presentazione di tassi sì. So we are half an hour late, which is a good place to start. <laughs> so I wonder if we should start with a Okay, so welcome back to this third session of our uh, Seminario Permanente di Narratologia. Um, I'm your host, Antonio Bipo. And um, I can't wait to uh, start this very rich afternoon. We have very like cross medial session, I guess, this afternoon, talking about radio drama and uh, ending with video games. So it's very rich, and we're going to uh, explore, I guess, other um, maybe not levels this time, but worlds, mond, uh, uh, the world of. Uh, comics, uh, radio, and uh, um, video games as well. Uh, so our first uh, speaker today is um, Jarmila, not Jarmila. 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 Who said? Sorry, I was. It's okay. Jarmila <laughs> Mildorfan. She teaches English language and literature at the University of Paderborn. Uh, and her research interests are in social narratology, audio narratology, radio drama, dialogue, autobiography, and oral history and medical humanities. So, so quite a wide range of uh, topics. She's the author of Storing Domestic Violence, Constructions and Stereotypes of Abuse and Discourse of General Practitioners, um, and also of Live Storying in Oral History, Fictional Contamination and Literary Complexity. <laughs> Uh, her, uh, I like. Um, I want to uh, mention her uh, habilitation uh, in uh, 2019, and the topic, I guess, of the habilitation was of the habilitation probably uh, was on reading fictional dialogue, text, context, and uh, cognition. Uh, today, she's going to uh, talk about metalepsis in radio drama. Uh, audio narratological perspectives. So I'm going to leave the floor to Yermila. Thank you so much. Uh, and thank you for the invitation that I'm allowed to speak here, which I feel very honored about. Um, and I'm sad that I can't be there in person, but I hope that at least through this means we can be uh, in contact here. 
Okay, I'm going to share my screen so we can have a look at my PowerPoint. Um, is this okay? Yes. Okay. Right. So I give you a quick outline of what I'm going to present in the next 20 minutes or so. Um, so first of all, I'm going to just touch again on some theoretical questions, which I guess you've already covered in great detail over the past one and a half days. Um, then I'm going to address specifically the question of metalepsis and radio drama and some of the specifics in this uh, special medium. And I'm going to illustrate that with some examples and then finally draw some conclusions concerning that. So let's start with some general theoretical questions. Um, by and large, metalepsis has been defined as a transgression of narrative boundaries. So the, the structuralist approach, we could say, looks primarily at a transgression of boundaries, whether it's um, you know, upwards or downwards or in whatever direction, metaphorically speaking, um, it doesn't matter. Um, and some scholars have talked about exterior or interior as well as story and discourse level metalepsis, okay, that these transgressions can happen at the story discourse distinction and at these two different levels. Uh, Ryan has also distinguished between ontological and rhetorical metalepsis and many theories in the field um, can be looked at from these two vantage points, whether it's something related to a character actually moving to another level with the narrator moving or the author moving uh, to another narrative level um, or whether it's simply a gesture that implies um, some kind of movement. Um, more scholars have focused more on the reception side. I have this echo. Do you also hear some Echo, do we need to switch up something? A little bit, actually. Um, yeah. Maybe, uh, can you, can we, can you try, can you try and talk now? Because maybe it's the, the microphone was pointed at the room, so maybe that's, uh, can you, can you speak now and see if that... Yes, works? hello? Okay, I think that's better because I was just yeah. hearing all this. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I just continue. Um, yeah, so other scholars have uh, focused more on what this does to the actual act of narration, okay? So that it's not simply um, a structural feature happening in the narrative and affecting the different narrative boundaries, but that it actually does something to the overall narrative act. And, uh, scholars like Hannebeck have also taken into consideration the readerly side um, and the effects on readers um, of metalism. That the readers are made aware of the fact that something is going wrong as far as the narrative act is concerned. And something similar was argued by Kukkonen, who said um, with metalepsis, readers are reminded either that someone is telling the story or that there is a reality outside the fictional world, okay? So this transgression, which actually makes us aware of the fact that what we're dealing with is a fiction, um, and in that sense, I think other scholars have mentioned the term defamiliarization, that metalepsis is, of course, um, a prime example for the functioning of defamiliarization in, in literary texts. Um, other scholars have draw, also drawn this connection to, met, to fictionality and this question of illusion and disillusionment, okay? So if we consider a piece of fiction as trying to create an illusion of a story world, then metalepsis would be the technique that disrupts this, that creates a disillusionment uh, and again makes us aware of the fact that it's a piece of fiction that's been designed in a specific way. Okay, so these are just very briefly some of the, the key concerns um, uh, related to the study of metalepsis. And I'm now trying to sort of adopt that for the study of radio drama from audio narratological perspectives. I think radio drama can offer a lot of um, material that can be studied 
and that maybe sheds new light on this question of metalepsis as well. So to start with, um, any art form that, that is not simply a written narrative um, will have not just the story discourse dichotomy, but also a medial representation. So there are actually three dimensions to bear in mind here. Um, this also means that storytelling, and I deliberately put this in inverted commas here, um, happens through other semiotic channels, okay? And here I refer to um, a great essay by Lars Bernhardt, who um, delineates in great detail tell how radio drama mediates a story world, okay? And he talks about this question of storytelling not being a telling in the proper sense of the word, but a telling that's distributed across various channels and in which um, not just one person as a, a narrator or author is involved, but actually a whole team of uh, participants who create a, a radio drama piece. So this is something that we need to bear in mind that radio drama complicates the picture when it comes to this idea of storytelling and the question of mediation. Um, what we also find in radio drama is that there can actually be a lot of shifts between the intra and extra diegetic levels. So, so one level at which um, metalepsis commonly occurs actually occurs quite naturally, one could say, or frequently in radio drama, because a lot of times sounds will move or music will move between extra and intradiegetic. More recently, I've worked quite a lot on music in radio drama, and I found numerous examples where we have instances where music is used on the extra diegetic level, level to, for example, structure scenes, separate scenes, but then it kind of fades into music that we suddenly realize is also within the story world, okay? So for example, someone playing the piano or an orchestra playing. So what, what at first seemed like an extra diegetic level with music doing a separation uh, turns into something that happens inside the story world, okay? And these kinds of transgression happen quite frequently in especially contemporary radio drama. Um, so when we look at metalepsis, then the question is, do we want to count these moves already as metalepsis um, or are they simply special techniques that radio drama applies to create uh, certain effects and also to fulfill certain narrative functions with them? Um, so when we think of metalepsis, it's not only on the verbal level, as we would have in a verbal or written narrative, but we must take into account the specific radiophonic affordances. And then we come close to the question of meta radio drama. And, and one of the, the questions I think one could explore further here is whether metalepsis turns into something like meta radio drama. <laughs> Um, just as we have meta theater, for example. Okay, so these kinds of self reflexive moves um, that also mean that certain boundaries are transgressed and that make listeners aware of the fact that what they're listening to is a piece of radio drama. So the effect on listeners, I think, is also a key question when we look at radio drama, because obviously um, listeners do a lot of work to imagine the story world just by listening to certain cues that they are given through the oral um, channel. Okay, I'd like to um, illustrate some of these questions with examples and there are plenty of examples out there for moments in radio plays that can be considered metalepsis. Um, so to go to a classic in radio drama, Orson Welles' The War of the Worlds, which is an adaptation of H.G. Wells's novel of the same name. Um, in this radio play, we see right from the beginning an instance of metalepsis in the sense that Wells, as the radio producer, um, also appears as an anchor, so the person who introduces the radio play. 
Um, so he says something about what's going to happen, but then he immediately speaks words that are actually directly quoted from Wells's novel. Okay, so he he seems to be talking as a radio anchor or radio speaker addressing the audience, but the words that he uses are already lifted out of the original text. And here we see how the boundaries between fact and fiction start to blur because Wells appears in his own character or persona. He's not uh, hiding behind a role, but he is actually Orson Welles at that moment. Um, we also see throughout the play that it's very closely modeled on radio programs and on features of different radio programs, such as breaking news, such as music radio. Um, so the, the, the whole piece oscillates between these various moments where we seem to be listening to some news item or we seem to be listening to uh, music radio that's meant to entertain us. But of course, it's all part of the fictional world. OK, so the, the, the trick in this play is to create a sense of us listening to a regular radio program but in fact what we're listening to is a fictitious radio program which then uh, contains this outrageous story of martians having landed on earth um, another technique that um, alerts us to this constructedness is the silence that's suddenly used at certain moments in the radio play to indicate that communication has broken down, okay? As if there is suddenly no longer a communication with uh, a reporter on site or people, you know, reporting into the studio. Um, and uh, this points to radio's very own problem that it can't allow for sound because this would always indicate some kind of problem in communication. Okay, so all of these points suggest a sort of meta reflection on what radio as a medium actually does. And this is built into the story to also create suspense. Uh, my second example is a contemporary play by Dan Rebellato, a contemporary British radio playwright. Um, and it starts out with an interesting frame narrative, which features a conversation between a radio producer, voice actors who've come to record a new radio play, and the actual author. And the, the metaleptic aspect here is that the author featuring in this frame narrative is the actual author, Dan Rebellato. And I've brought along that example, so let's listen to this. I hope you can so hear I'm that. I'm used to it now, yeah, the new normal. It'd be really nice to get back into studio because mm. you've just got so much more flexibility in how you can record. Yeah, I suppose you do. Which is harder at home. Mm. Oh, hang on, I think our writer's here. I'm just going to let him in. Just connecting to audio. Do we have a schedule? Oh, I don't think so. No, I'm going to say something about that in a minute. I'm, okay. Hi, Dan. Dan, you're muted. Sorry, 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 sorry. I'm always doing that. So this is our writer, Dan. This is Rachel and Robert, who are our Naomi and Tom. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much for doing this. Nice work, man. It's really, really good words. It's great. It really lifts off the page. Yeah. Thanks. Well, look, we're just going to launch straight in. We don't have a schedule as such because the way it's written, it's continuous. So we thought we might just go from the top of record and see what happens. Mm. So, okay. okay. Yeah, sure. Just give me a moment to set up. Yeah. Yeah. So, Polly, um, we were talking before and we had an idea about something. I'm muted. And she's gone. Yep, she's gone. <laughs> All right, when she gets back. Yeah. Dan, we were saying we had an idea about something that we'd like to try, actually. Yeah, I think you should probably run that by Polly. It's sort of Polly okay. show at the stage. I'm just a writer. Okay, no problem. Hi, I'm sorry about this. We're still just setting up. Would just be another minute. Yeah, it is. It is no problem. Microphone muted. I had one question about the beginning, actually, Dan. Oh, sure. I'm probably missing something, but are they in his office building or outside it? I'm imagining a sort of atrium reception area. I probably didn't mind that. No, no, no. That's, that's sort of what I thought. Sorry, I better take this on mute. I won't be. Microphone like. muted. <laughs> Did she say anything to you about accent? No, why are you doing one? No, just my own voice. Oh. <laughs> Sorry about that. So let's go for a take, yeah? Okay, and then it goes on like this until they eventually start recording and then the actual radio play starts. And of course, 
the interesting aspect here is that the author is included in this frame narrative and the the voice actors here make an effort to make this sound as if this was um, a, a random conversation that they're having before the recording begins but of course as a listener you quickly realize these are acting voices rather than natural voices and that the the dialogue we have in the beginning must be scripted okay so this is already part of the actual story even though the story uh you and me technically only starts when the the radio play um, begins to be recorded there's also a lot of talk about audio equipment as a, you know as a topic but it also runs through the entire um, radio play as a theme and this shows the self-reflexivity of this radio play the reflexivity on radio as a medium on other um, audio um, devices as media so we have a zoom call and this idea of muting um, and and then of course the recording later on um, and we also have later on a, a rather strange setup that the the voice actors uh, decide to swap roles so that they can feel with the characters so the woman speaks the man's role the man speaks the 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 woman's role and this is very much in shakespearean fashion you know to to swap gender roles so we have a lot of playfulness here but the instance of metalepsis is really in the beginning when we have uh, and also at the end when we have the actual author being present in this conversation so we're all um, something similar happens in Alistair Gray's Lanark, uh, which was adapted to radio. Um, and I also dis uh, gus discussed that in an article. Here we have a similar um, scenario that the author, the actual author, reads himself. I mean, Grace Lanark is already a very postmodern piece of fiction, which uh, has a lot of metalepsis and transgressions of boundaries. And there's one moment in the novel where the author appears as a character or starts interacting with his characters. Uh, and that moment is recreated in the radio play. But here, interestingly, the actual Alistair Gray starts speaking. And of course, as a listener, if you don't know Alistair Gray, you won't realize that uh, at first glance. But when listening at the cast, you see that. And this creates a double joke. And I would say it's a, it's a form of double metalic because we have this metalepsis on the verbal level which is taken out of the verbal narrative of the the written narrative but then in the medium of radio with the actual voice of the author we have this doubling of that metaleptic move um and then my final two examples which i'm going to cover only very briefly uh, two radio adaptations by um, of Milton's Paradise Lost. One is the, the English BBC production and the other one, a German radio adaptation by Andreas Ammer, which I discuss in an article um, from 2021. And both are interesting because they both play with um, the, the original text and recontextualize it in an interesting way also including metalipsis so in the bbc production for example we have satan who suddenly features as as a kind of narrator or commentator who seems to be talking to us directly okay so he seems to be addressing us as the listening audience um, and this is a very interesting interesting transgression because technically satan is a character in milton's text um, but the question is, is this really a, a transgression of narrative levels or do we want to say, well, mm, at least in certain frameworks, Satan exists um, as a persona in the world. Um, so it's just a recreation of that kind of setup. OK, so it, it really plays with the existence of Satan and Satan both as a character, but then here assuming power by becoming actually a narrator and commentator who is very derisive about um, Milton and his you know, writing of Paradise Lost. In the German adaptation, we have very interesting moments of meta commentary on Milton's text. So um, in the course of the radio play, we have the narrator commenting on the style of the narrative, on the narrative trajectories and effects of the text. Um, the original um, radio play was performed on stage. That is to say, the audience could actually see the production process, could see how um, a radio play is 
uh, realized, and this is, of course, metaleptic in, in the true sense of the word, because it, there's a, a clear transgression between what's the story world and what's outside of that, what's the real world. Uh, and then towards the end, we have an interesting moment where characters start commenting on the actual performance. So they say something like, still speaking in their voice as characters, um, right, we've reached the end of this play and now we're going to give an encore, you know, and they really uh, play with the, the situatedness of the performance uh, in front of an audience. So this is another instance of metalepsis, I would say. Okay. So so looking at these examples, and many more could be found, especially in contemporary uh, radio plays, um, we, we have to say that in radio drama, metalepsis clearly cuts across story, discourse, and representation. So we always need to sort of have this triangular structure rather than just the dichotomy. And if we look at transgressions of, of levels, then we need to complicate the picture by not just considering story and discourse at the verbal level, but also look at how other semiotic channels contribute towards these uh, breaches or, or um, yeah, uh, crossings over into other um, domains. Uh, one question one could ask, but this would be really a theoretical question to explore further. Is metalepsis perhaps even an inherent feature of at least contemporary radio drama? Because as I said in the beginning, this transgression uh, of boundaries between the extra and intradiegetic level um, uh, when it comes to different sound aspects, it seems quite regular and happens really quite a lot in contemporary radio drama. Okay, so it's an aesthetics that's used quite frequently. And the question then is, um, can we say that radio drama in itself is already metaleptic in its outlook? Uh, but then, of course, if we take not just the structural aspect into account, but also this question of disillusionment and, um, you know, the idea of how listeners are made aware of listening to a piece of fiction, then we also have an analogy to what we see in theater, this breaking of the fourth wall, although we really need a new term here because obviously, uh, you know, since we can't see anything, uh, there needs to be some other conceptualization here. Um, and then, as I mentioned in the beginning, this movement towards meta radio drama, okay, that what we're looking at is not just um, metalepsis, but also taking into account audiophonic um, features, uh, the, the aspects that are inherent to radio drama that make us think of um, metalepsis at the level of technologies, of the sounds, and so on. And finally, there's also this question of um, drama genre, okay, radio drama genre, and whether there's a correlation between uh, occurrences of metalepsis in this latter sense of a disruption that also involves or affects the reader in a particular, the listener in a particular way, um, and whether it's connected to certain genres. And my hunch is, um, and having listened to a number of radio plays, I think there are certain genres that, of course, invite uh, the usage of metalepsis, such as, um, and we're going to hear that in the next talk by Giuseppe, uh, ghost stories, I mean, anything in the realm of fantasy, um, radio drama, or anything to do with mystery, perhaps detective fiction, that kind of thing. And then a whole other category, which I've also looked at more closely recently, um, radio drama genres that feature um, stories about mental illness, okay, where we see delusional minds and the representation of delusional minds. Metalepsis can be employed um, to great effects here too. So this question of genre, I think, is an interesting one to pursue further. Right, so I've um, raised more questions <laughs> than actually answered. Um, okay, and now I'm going to stop this. And I'd like to thank you for your attention. And I look forward to our discussion later on. Fantastic. <laughs> Thank you so much, Yermina. Uh, that was excellent. Um, I'm looking forward to the discussion later on, what we heard from Giuseppe Piscopo 
And I'm uh, actually really happy to introduce Giuseppe. He's a longtime friend. And uh, yes, we will swap places. But let me introduce you first. Uh, <laughs> and um, Giuseppe is a, is a lecturer at the University of uh, Roma III uh, in uh, literary criticism and comparative literature. And uh, he's a member of the Horizon 2020 project for trans art. Arc, I guess so it's archived in uh, transition. Uh, he previously previously worked as an associate lecturer at Edinburgh University and at the University of St Andrews as well. His publications that I would like to um, focus your attention on are mainly deal with uh, Pinchin Therapy Rainbow and uh, uh, Stefano Darigo Sarcinos Orca, which is the, the book is called the L'Eredità della Fine. Uh, and then there's another one which is more recent uh, on uh, Carlo Emilio uh, Gadda called Macchine d'Espressione. Uh, he's also edited uh, um, a lot of books and uh, participated in uh, um, a lot of projects, uh, including this, of course, Seminario di Narratologia Permanente, which is one of the um, long-time contributors to the uh, seminario. He is also a translator. He translated works by uh, Peter Brooks and Frederick Jameson and Franco Moretti into uh, Italian. And today, and I hinted at, he's going to he's going to talk about uh, radio drama. Uh, the title of his contribution is "Are You Shivering? Voice and Metalepsy in Radio Ghost Stories." Um, we will take answer on both papers uh, at the end of Giuseppe's contribution and. Uh, no, I just start. Technical <laughs> problems. Okay. <laughs> oh, I missed that. Uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, where is my PowerPoint? Are you on the desktop? No, it's not. There is a desk uh, desktop. Is is yeah. I know you did it, so that's why I'm even more surprised. Well, but speaking of ghost stories, there should be something actually. What is it? It's not here. Yeah. I, I think. Maybe you switch the desktop. Yeah. Okay, but maybe we can have it back in a circle. Okay. In uh, in the meantime. See, and that's why it's very strange. So it works. So in the meantime, I was wondering about thanking the organizers, yes. Because it would be some kind of narcissistic move, in a way. Just thank people. That's always good. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So I am on the because of it's a Okay. So I, um, it's strange speaking about radio without microphone before, but that's, that's fine. Uh, and well, I was, uh, I learned a lot in these few days, and uh, listened a lot, and rewrote a lot my my paper as well. So. It's uh, it has been very very interesting so far going on in, on on this project, and now I'm starting actually from a very 
from the advantage position of you know, being in the third panel after John Pierre, after Francois Lavocat, after Yarmira Mildov spoke, uh, and they have some kind of very inspiring talks. And that gives me, gives me the chance of minimizing any kind of introductory part and go straight forward to uh, the point, knowing that I'm not skipping any key passage because they have been already covered so deeply. And so, uh, in a rhetorical move, I mean, do not have to mention how and when Girard Genet coined the term. I don't have to mention that he defined it as an intrusion of the extra diegetic into the diegetic universe. And uh, definitely, I don't have to recall the Genetian categories and subcategories of metalepsis, especially after the rich and detailed analysis that our keynote speaker yesterday, John Pierce, gave. Uh, I might mention, though, um, Monica Flodernick recalling that Jeanette gave an example of metalepsis in the second chapter, Duration, when he refers to a typical Balzacian narrative post in La Ville Pied, in which a narrator and a reader together enter the Corman townhouse in order to gain a view of the scene. And I mention this especially because of the role this passage played in a moment the two moments in which Peter Brooks speaks about metalepsis in his reading for the plot. Um, oh, this is from Joy Division. There are several mentions of radio in, uh, in pop culture and pop, in pop uh, music. I'm using this just for post-punk reasons. Um, so, and uh, this is the passage, uh, but we know that the Balzacian novel, on the contrary, established uh, establish a typical extra-temporality descriptive, descriptive canon and uh, there is also and that was quoted and recalled by Titi today the note attached to the previous quote which Jeanette associates the trope to a metaphoric rings of judges that allows narrator and narrative to be present but invisible on the scene Okay, don't spoil the rings. <laughs> so the, the the rings of judges. So the narrator pretends to enter with the um, with the reader into the diegetic universe uh, so uh, since i'm following here yarmila mildorf in her audio, audio narratological approach and therefore transposing the metalectic trope to a purely oral medium when we read narrator and reader we should overwrite them uh, reversely with the word audience while considering the narrator as the one who bears the voice as a property of how the voice speaks or how the story is spoken. And I'm clarifying here that the term voice in narrative was coined in connection with the question who speaks. Uh, yet the determination of uh, narrative voice in terms of the question of who speaks incorporates for Jeanette further questions as when and from where, which is reflected also in the articulation of, of the chapter in, uh, in Jeanette, which, is, uh, which has three levels actually. Uh, three areas, time, level, and person. But the switch between media, so going into the radio, brings to a further question of how a narrator speaks, giving space to a characterization of the voice in a, in a dual sense, the one which is kind of physical, uh, that goes in the direction of the tone, the idiom, the speech style, the mood, and also how a particular voice speaks and it distinguishes itself from the other competing voices. And the second one is the, is the question for, of, of orality, which implies for me at this moment also in this particular uh, topic here, plot and storytelling. And here I get in my, my conceptual frame that Peter Brooks developed when in the chapter, the novel at the guillotine in, in, in reading from for the plot, he draws our attention specifically to the specific and curious intrusion of the arbitrary that we find in relation between an anecdote that serves as a source and armature for Le Rouge et Le Noir and the narrative discourse invented on its basis between the raw material 
of story and its elaboration in Julien's plot. This anecdote is strangely contextualized early in the novel and, uh, it's, uh, and condensed in, in a condensed and displaced form. So the ending of the novel appears to mark a new intrusion of the newspaper, the raw material that gave origin to the novel and now appears in the novel dictating that Julian must finish in the same manner as the prototype from whom he has markedly deviated. So this is maybe Julian shot, this is why, this is maybe Julian shot Madame de Renal because Antoine Berthet shot Madame Michaud. And um, Peter Brooks says that because, my because does not belong to the domain of source studies of psychological explanation, but to a narratological one. Julian is handed over to the guillotine because the novel collapsed back into the anecdote, the fait divers, in which it originated from uh, and had to diverge from. So this is the specific point that I'm going to elaborate, claiming, claiming the metalepsis as a deviation of the plot, as a sort of reinflotment of the raw material by the voice whose how speaks is precisely that deviation. Uh, then narrator in radio, when radio is at its best, is a mirror for orality, a second orality, secondary orality, of course, restored orality, of course, mediated by an electrical medium, of course, but yet his or her voice reenact a communicative strategy in which a narrator is a storyteller. And before to getting into the into Walter Benjamin, of course, again, I'd like to start with Plato, who besides was also responsible for the muse learning to write, putting Eric Avalok's powerful, recalling Eric Avalok's powerful image, which means he was responsible for the alphabetic century hierarchy of knowledge. There was a leap out of the culture of primary orality in, which, in this in primary orality, uh, one transmits knowledge through the spoken word, which is sound. Literal culture do so primarily through the written or printed word, which is enclosed in a space and literally enclosed. It's framed in a text so that the text is defined by what, what is in it, but also defined by the things that are outside of it, that are excluded from the text. So the relationship between the two types of culture with time and space will therefore be different just as their relationship with story is different. The oral society does not have documents, but memory and experience for remembering and being remembered. And a certain organization of the discourse, like formulas, programs, the rhythmic pattern. So uh, going back to Plato, Plato notes in his Phaedrus that the problem with the written texts is, uh, with the written text is that they, uh, they go around everywhere promiscuously and it's impossible to know how they will be received how they will be interpreted or acted upon the storyteller conversely can gauge audience reaction respond to question respond to skeptical looks and cope with the boredom so that the storyteller controls the audience his and her listeners and moves them around and now i'm introducing my first example here my first case, that is uh, of a Saki short story, The Open Window. Saki was the British writer H.H. H. Munro, who lived in the period that Eric Augsbaum called The Age of Empires, 1970-1916, which is the, also the year in which he died in the battlefields of World War I. I remember, I'm referring to the radio adaptation of The Open Window as Peter Brooks focused on the original story because it shows perfectly it's a very concise story, it's three, four pages. The interaction, as Peter Brooks says, the interaction of teller and listener. So the open window is from Beast and Super Beasts, 1914. It was adapted for the BBC Radio 4, as you can see here, in uh, May 2005, as the fifth and last episode of a series called Five Days by Saki. The story is about Frampton Nuttall, who in a search for a cure for his nerves, those in a rural retreat in the countryside with a letter of introduction from his sister, from his sister, and he arrives at Suppleton's house. So this is the general setting for the tale of terror he's about to, to hear. Uh, while waiting for Miss Suppleton, he makes to make her appearance, Mr. Nuttall is entertained by the self-possessed 
15 years old niece, Vera, in a drawing room with a French window open to the low wind. Once Vera got clear that Mr. Nuttall knows nothing about her hunt, she invents. So, now uh, Saki's short story starts from here, and uh, we are provided with the background that I gave you before in the second paragraph when the narrator takes on from Mr. Nuttall's words. The radio adaptation, on the other hand, creates the objective space case this objective construction of the story. Let me ask here the farewell on the train platform that sets the protagonist at the beginning of his journey. Then we have the first word pronounced by Phantom's sister, which is windowed, that in sort of Chekhov's gun moment, uh, appears now in the first act and will play its role later on in the, in the fifth act. And then we have a further setting that locates us in the countryside with a horse coach driver adding some negative hints uh, to the family uh, Mr. Nathan is, is playing is visit the subject. Nothing of that is in the short story which starts in Medias Dress, where the adaptation brings us later on after the first two minutes and let you hear something from it. I have to do it from here. You have your powders on your pants, don't you, Sam? Yes, I have. They will have hot water in the restaurant. Yes, of course. Yes. This is going to be extremely beneficial, I'm sure. I hope so. I didn't greatly appreciate my time in Norfolk. You were too solitary. You simply buried yourself down there and didn't speak to a living soul. This will be different. No more moping about on your own. Some of the people, as far as I can recall, mm -hmm. were very nuts. You have my letters an introduction. In my pocket, yes. Don't let them fall out. Please, Caroline, I haven't lost my wits. I can still look after myself. Oh, I do wish they wouldn't do that. Oh dear, I do so hate on. Um... Stop here just to show you the setting of the story that was created in there. Now we are at the Suppleton's house uh, where Mr. Nathan speaks with Vera and we have a kind of classical uh, board conversation when immersed in the in the boredom of the time passing with Mr. Nuttall waiting for Mr. Suffolk to, to arrive. And um, and uh, and then when when uh, Vera realized, well, as I told you, that Mr. Nuttall knows nothing about about uh, her aunt, she she uh, she starts inventing. So this is the very moment in which we have this, the new plot created. Perhaps. I've been undergoing a nerve cure, and my sister places great faith in the effects of country air. Great faith. I've seen a lot of England over the past months. And the most agreeable time in Sussex in the summer. Wiltshire, Devon too. Have you ever been to Devon? Holidaying on the sands. Yeah. Ah. I uh... <coughs> Do you know many of the people around here? Oh, I just so. That's the thing. No one at all. Caroline was staying here at the rectory, you know, some four years ago. And she gave me letters of introduction to some of the people in the area. Then you know practically nothing about my aunt. Mrs. Southampton? Only her name and address. Have you noticed something, Miss Sinatron? The clock. It stopped ticking. Oh. Yeah. So it is. That's all it. Yes. It's a very comfortable room, though, this, isn't it? All those sporting prints. 
Very cheery. My auntie's very cheery. Well, perhaps a little brisker than she used to be. More abrupt, one could say. Otherwise, one would hardly know. But there are little things, like the way she refused to change anything in the house. So I <clears throat> let you go with with all the other listeners to the boredom of, of an evening in there, with the clock ticking. And then Vera uses the clock that stops as a supernatural sign. And now she starts inventing her own uh, great tragedy that took place on that very day by drawing the attention to the window that was left open in an October day. And the window became the actual frame for, for a framed story that happened within, within uh, the open window. Now Vera tells that story. These were never recovered. That was the dreadful part of it. <clears throat> and now, because of it, poor aunt thinks that they'll come back one day. Oh, the, and... the, the, the tragedy is that her husband and a group of um, brothers and sisters, they went out hunting and they never come back a few years uh, ago. And uh, her aunt left the open window hoping for them to come back. A little brown spaniel that was lost with them and walk in at that window just as they used to do. That is why it's kept open every evening till it's quite dusk. Poor dear aunt. She's often told me how they went out, her husband with his white waterproof coat over his arm, and Ronnie, her youngest brother, singing Bertie, why do you bound, as he always did to tease her. She said it got on her nerves. Do you know, sometimes, on quiet evenings like this, I always get a creepy feeling that they will all walk in through that window. I, I, I have no idea. And then our hunt appears and Mr. Stapleton talks about, again, the weather, the prospect of uh, hunting season, local news. Nato talks about his poor health, it's, it's boredom again. Later on, Mr. Sapleton says she's waiting for her husband return with the shooting group, and Nato, influenced by the tragic stories has been told, takes that as an evidence of obsession. So that when Mr. Sapleton announces, here they are at last, just in time for tea, Nato turns to Vera, who cries not to be left alone, and in a chill shock of nameless fear, Pramto Napo looks in the direction of the window, and there he sees three figures walking across the lawn uh, towards them uh, with, a, with a dog and the voice of uh, a young voice chanting out, I said, Bertie, why do you bound? So Napo runs from the house for his life as fast as he can. Mr. Sub Mr. Suppleton returned all home with his baritone voice, asks who was the one that was running away, and his wife replies that it was a man who talked of nothing but his nerve illness, and then ran off without an apology, as he had seen a ghost, which is exactly uh, what he has, thanks to Vera's performance. And now Vera controls the plot again, offering an explanation in the form of an uh, Eastern fiction to the baffled subtletons. I expect it was the Spaniel. He told me he had a horror of dogs. He once was hunted uh, into a cemetery, cemetery somewhere in the banks of the Ganges by a pack of paria dogs and had to spend the night in a newly dug grave with the creatures snarling and grinning and foaming just above him, enough to make anyone lose their nerves. Uh, the story ends with Mr. Suppleton saying, romance at short notice is rather has speciality. And Brooks builds on that and points out that in a larger sense, the story is about the power of storytelling. Um, Vera first story marked the generic indicator of tragedy succeeds in conjuring up ghosts for its listener when the hunter appears and her second story then allies the ghost by explaining Nuttall's excessive reaction. Uh, so Vera produced a story that swallowed his listeners showing uh, as Pierce stated in the uh, 
in these in his afterwards to the volume metalepsis in popular culture the fragility of the bone wire that separates uh the word of telling from the word of the tall and in terms of falling into the word of the tall in terms of seeing it it is very significant also what francois lavocat said about the auto the author and the character um and the presence of a sort of metalepsis of self-consciousness just in here we have a creature that turns into a creator where uh giving birth to a space in which is she swallowed another creature there so in other words Vera make him see the story a story which is which never was or better that was created by the storyteller so the listener the audience they see the story uh and that is the primary act of storytelling. The verbal media, says Werner Wolf, represent the domain par excellence of prototypical narratives. And that primary act is enacted also famously by Joseph Conrad at the beginning of two novels in which famously the leading voice of the story shows to its audience uh, the story that has to be, to be, to be seen. In here it says, my task, which I'm trying to achieve, is by the power of written word to make you hear, to make you feel. It is before all to make you see. And this is a nigger of the Narcissus. A uh, year later, uh, the uh, Joseph Cohen erased the written text. It's just the storyteller that speaks in here. Do you see him? We are on uh, on Nelly. That is stuck on the, the dock. Do you see him? Do you see the story? Do you see anything? Um, so this is the act of, of storytelling, to create a world for the listener to be seen. And um, I'd like to go on maybe with the second case that I'm presenting here. And it's uh, the house at the Spook Corner. Gary Griggs, is a 10 years uh, old boy in London who is possessed by a phantom, or he isn't. And uh, that was spook, the house at Spook Corner is a radio drama about fiction series, Saturn's Playground, produced by Justin Fox in the story, a man with a questionable approach to truth. What we are dealing there in the in storytelling is uh, one of the most famous cases of poltergeist in the UK that got the attention of different persons, the media people, Justin Fox and Ellis Weston, the, present, uh, the presenter of the program, Professor Vecchi, which is a skeptical scientist, and Davis Morris, uh, author of book on, para on, on paranormal. The, uh, so there is the first episode of the series that has been, that went on air 10 years before the story that we are about to hear. And uh, 10 years later, when uh, Greg's house is about to be, to, be, uh, to be destroyed, the new producer was to go back to the first episode and see all the material that hasn't been broadcast in, in the episode as such. So looking for, for a second truth and a second sight on the, on the story again. So what we are listening is actually the inspection and the collection of the preparatory material or the first broadcast uh, made on the 10 year boy Gary possession. But everything that we hear was just behind the scene. I want to show, I want you to listen to just this passage over here, which is the first time in which Gary uh, got a different kind of, of voice through which he speaks. He caps at night, go back, go down. We wondered who on earth it was. You get back to bed this instant, Mr. Griggs. Come on, go back to bed. It's lunch past your bedtime. Mr. Griggs, there's something wrong. Gary? Gary? He's got his eyes out. We would do sleep with their eyes open, is Look at those eyes. Gary. He hasn't blinked once. Gary, say something. Shut up, that bitch. Get out of this house. 
Gary, can you hear us? Can you say that again? I'll get the tape machine from upstairs. That sound English. Because I'm too polite, no? The answer is It's French. And he isn't being very polite. In fact, he's being bloody rude. That is a copy dick from someone at school. They teach French. They don't teach that sort of thing, Mrs. Gray. Can you speak French, Jim? Not very well. I spent a couple of months in Paris. Okay, so the, the ghost speaking French was too tempting not to be to be used in here. Um, do I have two minutes? Yeah. Okay, so just jump to the one and a half. Okay, just jump to the <laughs> conclusion in sense. Uh, so the conclusion is that all in a whole, who bears the who bears the voice does not own the raw material. Brooks was speaking of that in reading for the plot, but that possesses the plot which is in radio the mediability of how the real thing would sound, so the voice of the ghost in this case, uh, that the teller remediates in the, in the outer world. So my novel is finished and I would no longer be a monster, says Julian in the, uh, Julian in the Rouge and Renoir. That is, that is no longer the monster, whereas the monster is the enplopment because it's the figure of displacement, transgression, desire, deviant, Deviance instability, as Brooks says about the figure of Julian's project for himself, uh, is a projective plot. So I resorted to a highly characterized genre as ghost story, horror stories, to bring to the extreme what Peter what Brooks claims when he stresses plot itself, narrative design, and intention is the figure of displacement. Yeah. Yes. Is the is the uh, is the figure of uh, of displacement desire leading to change of position. The plot and narrative is a deviance from or transgression of the normal, a state of abnormality and error, which alone is narratable. So now, who does create the outer plot? The teller, the one who bears the voice, swallows also the other characters in it. Uh, I just finished by stepping back for a moment and to reflect on, on, on how radio, the first of the electric media of the 20th century, described itself in the tradition of devices and supports that carry the text. And I conclude with the words of Gabriele Frasca, every change in media ends up determining the variation of the forms um, of what is supported. Formula like write, the vocal performance, the clay tablet, the volume, and uh, more or less illustrated papyrus, the parchment codex, and then the paper codex, or rather the miniated manuscript, the printed page, the mosaic of newspaper sheet, the electrified and remotely project voice, and the computer screen allow, or rather demand, an extremely diversified use of language, just as they proceed to completely different practices of textualization, requiring the aid of different sense of organ, or at least a very different hierarchization of hearing, sound, sight, and, and touch. So all in all, uh, I think that it made sense of that at the table when we were having the lunch in a conversation with Paolo Giovannetti, because, well, maybe a single element to show that at very best is the Wizard of Oz, where the voice creates the lamp, creates the place in which all the characters are swallowed in. So one of the powers of the voice is one of created words in the sense that the Wizard of Oz showed. Okay, thank you very much indeed. There is a, a scare jump image over here. Don't, don't get too scared. Yeah, I don't Okay.
Sì, sì, parlava di un intervento finale di questi punti. Poi abbiamo anche la c'è l'acqua per voi adesso ci dà una poi poi c'è la in teoria ci sono dei bicchieri da poi ci sono loro due allora teniamo ci sono dei bicchieri da voi sì sì era mica c'è il caffè no adesso continua però non andate bene No, ma soprattutto eh, che, no, 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 la pausa la facciamo dopo. Eh, sì, dopo. Sì, sì, sì. Mettiamo all'ordine. Eh. Non lo puoi scaricare. Sì, sì. Sì, sì. Sì, Guarda, sì, sì, sì. E poi lo lascio aperto. Sì, sì, sì. Non so la fotografia. Questo adesso che abbiamo scaricato no, è una cosa bella. Posso, posso, posso disconnettere se mi arrivo una patologia o no? Ma no, perché c'è il link che si è connesso. No, sì, adesso non lo Se noi dovessimo stare un attimo, nella pausa, magari, se non c'è non c'è la ma dove sono i consiglieri che mi trovano su me giù? Sì, io ci metto un po' di più perché avevo calcolato, cioè avevo fatto partire il video del video. Vediamo la logica. Adesso ti tolgo la cosa. Scusa, ma in italiano? Ok, so Alors, on va continuer, et bien entendu, on va euh, switcher en français. <rire> on switch en français, au français, et euh, 
Euh, en fait, on a dû euh, interrompre à cause de problèmes techniques, mais ça ne m'a pas donné la, la possibilité de euh, remercier euh, Marc Lévala, du fait de l'Iscopo, pour euh, euh, sa contribution qui était très, très, très intéressante et très riche. Il y avait plein de questions. Euh, pour lui. Ah non, bien. Vous voyez que vous êtes bien mis. <rire> euh, mais là, c'est aussi un plaisir de présenter Mathilde Manal. Euh, vous la connaissez tous, mais en tout cas, je vais, euh, je vais parler un peu d'elle. Euh, elle, euh, elle a étudié euh, l'être moderne à l'Université de Sienne de 2017 à 2020. Elle a été allocataire d'une bourse Inspire. 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 <rire> Inspire, Marie Curie, <rire> auprès de l'Université de Chocobotevelle, euh, Paris 3, où elle a soutenu sa thèse en littérature comparée sur la poésie moderniste publiée chez la thèse. Sa thèse est publiée chez Classique Garnier en 2023. Euh, de 2020 à 2022, elle a été euh, à l'Université de Lille. Non, mais en tout cas, elle a, elle a surtout, et je vais euh, me concentrer sur cette rôle le plus récent, la traduction de, à l'édition de la correspondance entre Franco Bottin et uh, Enzesberg, Hans Magnus Enzesberg, euh, qui a paru chez Quad des Bêtes en 2022, euh, et une monographie sur uh, Andrea Del Torto. Euh, en 2021. Euh, euh, Aujourd'hui, Mathilde va nous parler de, enfin, le titre de son introduction est « Je peux parler, métalepses et voix off dans le miroir d'André Tarkovsky. » Merci, merci à toutes et tous. Et s'il te plaît, euh, euh, sois violent et interrompe-moi si je parle pour trop longtemps. Donc, je bien. suis euh, bien sûr très, très reconnaissante, mais aussi assez intimidée de parler devant tant d'expertes et d'experts en, en narratologie. Donc, je ne suis pas du tout à ma place dans ce domaine euh, passionnant, mais labyrinthique. Et donc, ce que je vais faire, c'est plutôt de partager quelques questions. Euh, et pour ce faire, je vais reprendre une autre question qui m'était euh, venue à l'esprit lors du dernier euh, colloque de l'association Compite. Francesco était là et on en, on en parlait récemment. Et je me demandais, et question très de, de profane en narratologie, je me demandais si l'existence d'une œuvre de fiction romanesque implique l'existence, plus ou moins implicite, bien sûr, de moins un narrateur, est-ce que euh, l'existence d'une fi fiction filmique l'implique tout autant Et si ce n'est pas le cas, c'est-à-dire si on peut avoir des films sans narrateur, qu'en est-il de la métalepse Qui et comment Simiche invisiblement dans le récit, sortant et rentrant à son goût des différents niveaux diégétiques. Il me semblait notamment que, à la différence de ce qui a lieu dans le roman, il est rare de trouver dans le cinéma des situations analogues à celles dont, à la recherche du temps perdu de Marcel Proust, est le modèle, c'est-à-dire de trouver des récits dont le narrateur coïncide avec un personnage d'auteur, ou plutôt dans le cas du film de réalisateur, qui dans le film nous raconte l'œuvre que nous sommes en train de regarder. Ah, je parle bien sûr de, de, de films de fiction. Un exemple proche, mais pas exactement pareil, me venait à l'esprit déjà à l'époque, et euh, particulièrement la première scène qui s'ouvre par une prolepse, à la fois illustrée et racontée par la voix off d'un personnage d'auteur, plutôt de critique littéraire, à vrai dire, de critique de cinéma, à vrai dire, le film que vous connaissez euh, probablement est « All about Eve ». Et euh, ce film commence effectivement avec les mots de Harrison DeVitt qui euh, nous illustre la fin de l'histoire de la comédienne Margot Channing que le film va ensuite euh, reprendre du début. Donc, en fonction du rôle que nous euh, attribuons à la voix off de DeVitt, on peut résumer celle qui euh, me paraissent être les trois premières euh, interprétations du rapport entre euh, ce dispositif et celui du narrateur. Pardon, il y a une coquille, euh, c'est Zmodin avec euh, deux O, donc Zmodin, je pense, mais vous me corrigerez euh, éventuellement. Donc, première option, nous pouvons penser que la totalité du film qui nous est introduit par la voix off de David est prise en charge par un narrateur fondamental qui non seulement relate les événements, mais les a aussi organisés en amont, en leur donnant une forme narrative. 
Donc cette lecture recoupe les théories d'André Gaudreau, de François Yost et de David Adam Black, entre autres, qui veulent que puisque la, la structure narrative est inhérente au cinéma moderne, fondée sur l'énonciation d'une transformation, eh bien cette énonciation doit euh, prévoir une instance narrative implicite qui souvent se manifeste par le recours à, à la voix off, ici celle de, de David. Deuxième option, on peut aussi penser, et ce en accord avec les visions de Brian Anderson et de Sarah Kosloff, considérer David comme un narrateur délégué du récit, quelqu'un qui ne prendrait que le relais de certaines tâches, les mêmes tâches, à vrai dire, que le narrateur fictif à la Proust rempli en littérature. Donc cela implique que le récit qu'il dispense puisse être analysé comme l'un des niveaux diégétiques possibles, mais différent car verbal des récits que produisent le son ou les images. Troisième option, euh, qui, 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 qui s'inscrit dans le sillage de Smodin, de Smodin et de Collet, euh, le rôle de la voix off dans All About Eve consiste à donner un récit filmique, une dimension subjective, d'évite narrateur agissant comme une sorte de conscience qui filtre l'histoire et l'offre à son public à travers une focalisation précise. Donc là, on glisse plutôt du côté de la focalisation que non, de la, euh, que non de la, euh, de, du rôle de narrateur. Mais on peut aussi euh, penser ou se demander plutôt si ces trois visions ne seraient pas compatibles et même présentes à la fois dans ces films qui ont une portée métafictionnelle explicite et qui questionnent, parfois dénoncent eux-mêmes, l'aplatissement du récit filmique sur le récit littéraire. Donc je vais essayer de sonder cette possibilité d'interpréter la voix off comme un concept antersémiotique pour mesurer, utile à mesurer, l'état des relations entre littérature et cinéma à certains étapes de leur histoire. Et je vais le faire à l'aide d'un film d'Andrei Tarkovsky, euh, donc un euh, réalisateur russe qui me semble très peu étudié sous le prisme de la narratologie, mais là aussi je pourrais me tromper, et qui pourtant dans ses pellicules des années 70 n'arrête pas d'interroger la question du narratif au cinéma. Et donc, est-ce que les très nombreuses voix off qui sont présentes dans ces films euh, sont à considérer comme première option, et je reprends les trois, les trois hypothèses que je, que je viens d'évoquer, est-ce qu'elles sont à considérer comme les traces d'une instance narrative, d'un méga-narrateur implicite qui se mêle quand il veut à son propre récit Est-ce qu'elles sont à considérer, deuxième option, comme l'expression d'un des plusieurs niveaux diégétiques présents dans le film Ou bien est-ce qu'elles sont un moyen de questionner la légitimité même du rapprochement entre fiction filmique et fiction littéraire Donc je vous prends un seul exemple, le miroir. Et pour le moment, je dirais que le miroir raconte et est raconté à la fois par Alexei. Alexei est un cinéaste, il est frappé par la maladie, il ne s'entend plus bien avec sa mère, ni avec son épouse, ni avec son fils. Il est dans une situation de détresse et cette situation l'amène à se souvenir de sa maison d'enfance, de sa mère quand, ils étaient, quand elle était jeune de la manière dont leur père, un poète comme le père de Tarkovsky d'ailleurs, les a abandonnés, ainsi que d'événements divers euh, liés à la Deuxième Guerre mondiale. Or, le problème, c'est que tout cela, euh, personne ne nous le dit. Euh, ce que nous voyons à l'écran, c'est un mélange de mémoires, de rêves, d'images en prétendues du prise directe et de documents d'archives qui sont assemblés dans un récit euh, alternant pellicule en noir et blanc, pellicule couleur, euh, montage très serré et long, long, long plan séquence. Donc, nous avons aussi euh, une interprénétration entre le présent de la narration, on serait en 1975, donc à, à la date où le miroir paraît, sort en salle, et souvenir du passé, là nous sommes plutôt autour des années 30 ou 40, et cette euh, interprénétation nous euh, questionne euh, sur l'urgence de définir ou pas le miroir un récit, en nous invitant à nous demander s'il ne serait pas plus important de déterminer si son narrateur est présenté comme s'il était fictif ou comme s'il était réel. Donc j'utilise le comme un peu pour reprendre la distinction entre jeu origine et euh, jeu littéraire hein, euh, établi euh, par Kate Hamburger. Donc c'est en effet la confusion entre des états d'expérience temporelles et spatiales différents et incompatibles d'un point de vue logique entre eux que produit dans le spectateur un sentiment d'étrangeté. 
Ce sentiment est accru par le fait que Tarkovsky choisit la même actrice pour jouer à la fois le rôle de la mère et celui de l'épouse, et sa propre mère pour jouer à la fois le rôle de la grand-mère et celui de la mère du protagoniste. Et enfin, sa deuxième femme pour jouer le rôle de la femme du médecin. En plus, il y a d'autres, comment dire, d'autres intrusions du réalisateur sont présentes. Ici, vous pouvez voir plus ou moins bien une affiche du premier film, du film précédent de Tarkovsky affiché dans le mur de la chambre. Donc, nous avons une toute première scène qui se trouve avant même le générique. Donc, nous sommes dans le paratexte filmique et qui me paraît avoir quelques, quelques buts programmatiques que j'essaierai de vous montrer. Pardon, j'avais préparé des, des slides, mais apparemment, ça ne marche pas très, très bien. Donc, je vais m'interrompre à plusieurs reprises. Donc, en réalité, vous auriez dû entendre les mots au moment où la, où la couleur passe en noir et blanc, mais ce n'est pas très important, il doit y avoir un un petit écart entre son et voix. Nous sommes dans une scène à peu près documentaire ou avec un effet documentaire de hypnose pour arrêter le bégayement de ce, de ce jeune homme. Je vous montre juste la fin. Voilà, et le film commence. Donc cette scène, hein, vous le voyez, elle est programmatique sous plusieurs aspects. Déjà, nous regardons cette scène sur l'écran d'une télévision qui est vue par un enfant. C'est la toute première, le, le tout premier plan qui en fait n'a pas de son, à vrai dire, à part pour euh, la télévision qui est allumée. Et une, un deuxième plan plus long en style documentaire avec cet effet euh, justement de mélange de noir et blanc et de couleurs et d'effet d'authenticité qui est présent tout au long du film aussi par l'inscription des images d'archives que j'ai déjà évoquées. En plus, le jeune qui guérit du bégaiement est un acteur qu'on verra jouer dans le film tout à l'heure. Donc, dans, le plupart, dans la plupart des films, la voix, le dialogue, mais la voix aussi, aide à réduire l'ambiguïté des énoncés visuels. Eh bien, la particularité du miroir consiste dans le fait qu'il renverse ce présupposé, puisque au long du film, nous n'apercevons jamais le corps d'Alexei, donc du narrateur, du prétendu narrateur. On ne le voit qu'enfant, et quand il est enfant, il est presque toujours muet, mais on ne le voit jamais adulte dans le film, ni nous sommes certains que la focalisation reste sur lui tout au long du film. Sa voix est cependant présente tout au long de la pellicule, mais ce qui est intéressant de remarquer, c'est que cette voix off change de statut au fil des séquences. Tantôt, cette voix off prend le rôle du narrateur, donc d'Alexei adulte qui se souvient de sa vie. Tantôt, elle prend le rôle d'un personnage, Alexei jeune qui parle d'une autre pièce qu'on ne voit pas. Tantôt encore, celui de l'auteur à la fois Tarkovsky et le père de Tarkovsky, Arseny, un poète, dont les poèmes sont lus à plusieurs reprises dans le texte, mais qui se confond aussi avec le père poète euh, du protagoniste. Donc les autres personnages, de plus, s'adressent très souvent à cette voix off, lui répondent quand elle parle, réagissent, et même parfois laissent penser que par leur position, qu'un autre corps serait présent dans l'espace, mais on ne pourrait pas le voir. Donc, ces trois voix off, disons pour simplifier, voix off du narrateur, du personnage et de l'auteur, sont, sont, sont rapprochées par un trait de caractère, c'est la défaillance de leur mémoire. Et c'est pourquoi on peine à les identifier avec une seule instance narrative omnisciente. D'autant plus que ces voix ne relatent pas exactement d'une transformation, comme le voudrait la grammaire du récit, et s'immiscent à l'action, 
la découvrent, la produisent, la commentent, mais elles ne sont pas censées l'avoir organisée en amont. Et d'autres procédés plus strictement filmiques que le laisse penser, par exemple le fait que les coordonnées géographiques et temporelles données par la voix off sont parfois contredites par les mouvements de la caméra, ou alors par le fait que si le travelling installe le décor, on a aussi un autre type de mouvement que la voix de, qui se rapproche ou qui s'éloigne euh, du microphone euh, nous laisse penser qu'il sera, euh, qu sera euh, mené. Donc, je vais vous montrer encore quelques scènes en essayant d'être le plus rapide possible avec des types de voix off différentes. Là, c'est la toute première scène d'après le générique. Donc ici, on est censé être aux, euh, pendant les années 30, mais vous verrez que la voix off, elle est censée se situer en 1974, à la donc je saute encore, vous voyez c'est des longs plans séquences, donc en fait on est encore dans la même scène, mais j'avance un tout petit peu. Donc, cette première voix off que vous avez entendue, c'est la voix off d'Alexei, réalisateur qui se souvient de son enfance. Donc, c'est une voix off de, de narrateur, pour, pour simplifier encore une fois. La scène est assez longue, donc je vais la reprendre. Excusez-moi, mais j'avais tout noté dans le, dans le PowerPoint, donc c'est plutôt ici. Donc l'homme est reparti, la femme rentre chez elle et une autre voix off euh, commence à parler. Et elle ne s'arrête qu'au moment où la femme entend des cris et des rumeurs diverses, des bruits divers. Voilà, donc là, vous avez 
un autre type de voix off, c'est la voix off qui, avec un ton solennel, récite un poème d'Arsénie Tarkovsky, le père poète du réalisateur, mais peut-être aussi dans la fiction filmique, le père poète d'Alexei. Donc la première voix off ajoute simplement un niveau diégétique à celui illustré par l'image. La deuxième se situe sur un tout autre plan, mais un plan qui permet quand même d'assurer, aux dépenses de toute vraisemblance, le passage d'une scène à l'autre, ce que la première voix off ne faisait pas. Puisque le poème continue d'être récité jusqu'à ce que l'on entend des cris, des voix qui sont des voix hors champ, donc ce n'est pas tout à fait la, la même chose que des voix off, j'y reviendrai si, si nécessaire. Et ces voix hors champ réveillent la femme de sa rêverie. Donc on pourrait même penser que cette deuxième voix off coïncide avec ses propres pensées. Mais dans ce cas, est-ce que cette voix off est à l'intérieur de l'image, au sens de la conscience du personnage, ou est-ce qu'elle vient encore d'un autre niveau diégétique, comme je le proposais en première, en première hypothèse Je vous montre encore une dernière scène, qui, qui en fait, vous le voyez, à vrai dire, je vous montre la toute première partie, je saute des éléments, mais je ne suis pas en train de sauter des scènes, c'est juste des parties. Et là, la scène se termine par l'image la plus connue euh, du miroir, l'image de l'incendie de la Lancha. Une image qui reviendra dans les films de Tarkovsky et même dans son tout dernier, Le Sacrifice. Et ça, c'est la, la troisième scène que, que je voulais vous montrer. Passage en noir et blanc. Et passage en noir et blanc, mais avec euh, une image aplatie. Et il y a tout un, un travail sur la profondeur aussi qui, qui change. Je, je suis désolée, je pense que vous voyez vraiment très très peu de l'image. Peut-être maintenant un tout petit peu mieux. En tout cas, il est question de deux minutes. Vous voyez aussi les images sont au ralenti dans cette, dans cette scène, aplatie. Les sons sont aussi en décalé. Il y a plusieurs indices qui laissent penser qu'on est dans un autre régime que le souvenir simplement. Il nous a été illustré jusqu'ici. Regardez les, les murs de la chambre qui sont tout moisis. Et je vais sauter encore. Et vous montrer encore une minute des films. Donc, jusqu'ici, il n'y a pas eu de coupe, on est dans la même. Là, il y a une coupe, une image de main brûlante. La fiche du dernier film de Tarkovsky. Ну, 
А сколько сейчас времени? Сейчас, собственно, что? Около шести, наверное. Что вас Ну, как сказать, D'abord, Alexei parle d'un film, d'un film qui lui paraît euh, bien abouti. Euh, il ne veut pas en dire plus, mais il est très probable qu'il parle du miroir ou d'un film qu'il qu vient de terminer de tourner en 75. Euh, et puis, il demande à sa mère des renseignements. Il lui dit « J'ai rêvé de toi ». Donc, probablement, la scène que nous venons de voir en noir et blanc est le rêve qu'Alexei vient de faire. Enfin, ce sont des suppositions, puisqu'il ne nous le dit pas. Et ensuite, il lui demande « Te, te, te souviens-tu » pardon de l'incendie de la dacha, donc la scène que nous avons vue avant le rêve. La mère lui rappelle en quelle année ça s'est passé et puis lui donne une information sur ce qui vient de se passer, c'est-à-dire la mort d'une personne de leur passé. Et en ce moment, elle lui donne aussi des coordonnées plus ou moins précises sur le temps présent, sur le présent de la narration. Donc cette scène composée, à vrai dire, de deux actions que je vous ai montrées, elle est assez nécessaire à toute lecture narrative du film parce qu'elle nous présente le chronotope du rêve et de la mémoire qui vont se retrouver tout au long du film et qui sont toujours au ralenti et en monochrome, et avec ces, ce jeu de décalage du son et aplatissement de l'image. Donc, cette voix off, la voix off au téléphone qui relate du passé mais parle au présent de la narration, elle non plus, on ne saurait pas où la, la situer. Est-ce qu'elle vient de la chambre que la, la caméra est en train de nous montrer Mais alors, quelle est cette chambre et dans quel rapport est-elle avec celle qui hébergeait le jeune Alexei Donc, à l'aide de, de la voix off, et je vais vers ma conclusion, Tarkovsky me semble sinon supprimer, du moins déranger, la portée narrative des situations visuelles et sonores, ce que normalement la, la voix est censée plutôt éclaircir que, que déranger. Et euh, il, comme s'il souhaitait laisser cette dimension transformative et, et linéaire propre euh, au récit filmique flotter en dessus de ces éléments visuels et sonores. Cet effet peut-être est censé témoigner d'états d'esprit bizarres comme le presque rêve, mais ce n'est pas entièrement un rêve, ou le pseudo-souvenir, mais ce n'est pas entièrement un pseudo-souvenir, un souvenir non plus, comme une réalité euh, au, dont les temporalités devraient s'exclure logiquement l'une l'autre et qui sont pourtant présentées comme si chacune avait eu lieu, confondant ainsi les catégories de présent, passé et futur, mais aussi celles de narrateur, de personnage et d'auteur. Donc on peut se demander si ces éléments qui éloignent le récit euh, filmique du récit littéraire le font vraiment, ou si plutôt ils, ils essayent de les approcher, puisque d'une part ils surgissent dans un contexte, celui du film, où euh, le public s'attend peut-être à les rencontrer. Euh, peut-être que euh, Tarkovsky euh, essaye de, de décevoir quelque part les attentes narratives de son, de son spectateur euh, pour mettre en évidence des structures qui sont à son avis propres à l'univers filmique, donc à un univers autre que celui de la littérature. Et donc, dans cette optique, ces stratégies de Metalex par voix off serviraient à mettre sous pression, quelque part, les lois et l'imaginaire que nous avons d'une fiction cinématographique. Je dirais plutôt l'imaginaire que le spectateur a de, de ce dispositif que l'on peut être ses propres lois. Donc, ma question, pour, pour terminer, c'est la suivante. À part pour les indices extra-verbaux que je vous ai présentés, le virage en noir et blanc, les plans séquences au ralenti, qui sont d'ailleurs des dispositifs que vous trouvez aussi dans d'autres films de Tarkovsky, euh, dans des films de Tarkovsky de science-fiction, ou alors il, il y a bien sûr d'autres conventions aussi qui sont en place. Est-ce que, à part pour ces indices extra-verbaux, il est possible de distinguer dans ce film ou dans d'autres de Tarkovsky les voix off métaleptiques, donc celles qui rompent le cours de la diégèse en nous présentant un, un paradoxe euh, logique, de celles qui restent au sein du même niveau narratif ou d'un autre, 
dont on peut imaginer qu'il serait présent dans, le, dans la fiction pas rendu problématique par le fait que j'ai l'impression en théorie littéraire on sépare assez facilement focalisation et narration et on peut aussi les, les hiérarchiser alors que dans le film et dans le film de Tarkovsky en particulier cette séparation entre focalisation et narration n'est pas aussi simple à, à, à mener et donc j'ai notamment l'impression que l'emploi de la voix off ne soit pas toujours une marque de paradoxe ou d'illogicité et qu'en fonction de la place qu'on accorde au narrateur, mais pas dans le film en général, mais vraiment de, 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 de séquence en séquence, euh, alors ou bien la métalette se sera toujours en cours dans le miroir, et on deviendra presque la condition préliminaire, strictement liée comme elle est d'ailleurs au procédé d'analepse, d'ellipse et de, et de prolepse, ou bien elle sera un procédé presque non transposable de la littérature au cinéma. Et je vais juste vous montrer... Donc, si on y pense, de même que, euh, et je termine là pour de vrai, de même que euh, en 2004, euh, Genette rapprochait et superposait les stratégies qui ont trait euh, à l'ordre du récit, donc à l'analexe de celles qui ont trait à la métadégèse, donc au niveau du récit, de même, hein, c'est un rapprochement assez hasardé, Tarkovsky se sert de la voix off, non pas pour montrer en les imitant comment fonctionnerait la mémoire ou le rêve, mais plutôt pour montrer comment le film ne peut et ne veut pas, si son, si son but est celui d'être logique, d'avoir une suite, nous euh, présenter ces, euh, ces dispositifs. Et donc, ainsi, Tarkovsky, il inviterait son public, y compris son père Arseni, qui en sortant de, du miroir lui avait dit « ce ne sont plus des films que tu fais, Andréi » à ne pas aplatir la fiction cinématographique sur la fiction littéraire, mais plutôt à suspendre ces images en mouvement dans un lieu qui se situe hein, entre euh, la technique, euh, l'enthousiasme de la technique, on disait ce matin, et euh, la mimesis. Donc, euh, j'ai commencé ma communication par une question sur la manière de transposer des concepts littéraires dans le cinéma, et je me demande et vous demande maintenant comment on pourrait faire l'inverse, c'est-à-dire comment on pourrait restituer en littérature, avec les seuls moyens du texte, ce que euh, fait la voix off, c'est-à-dire cet écart continu, cette perturbation continue entre l'énonciation et euh, le récit, si le récit, euh, il est question. Merci. Toute la bibliographie n'est pas affichée, je, je pense, mais elle est à peu près, à peu près là. Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup, Adil. Je ne sais pas si je ne vais pas trop dépasser. Non, 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 c'est une belle année. Ah, non, 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 I think it was interesting to have a look at different media as well after we discussed. Uh, I think Yermila, I hope you're still with us. Uh, maybe if you, if you can turn your camera on again. Yeah. yeah. Oh, fantastic. Thank you. And uh, so we had a couple of talks on um, radio and radio dramas, and then we moved on to a very. Uh, narrative kind of cinema, but at the same time, very, uh, sorry, lyrical kind of uh, cinema, that is the cinema of uh, Andrei Tarkovsky. Uh, I'm sure we have loads of questions. I, I just want to ask you a very quick thing, because you probably said that, uh, but um, one of the... <laughs> Una delle voci, one of the voices that we actually hear in the in the film is the voice of the father of uh, Tarkovsky, right? Because I don't know if you if you mentioned that. I think the I... poems are from his father. Yeah, but it's the voice actually his as well. Because I, think... I seem to remember that, but I know. Yes, I actually I'm not quite sure about it. it, mm -hmm. it... I, I was also wondering about mm -hmm. it. I, I'm, I'm sure that the poems are from mm -hmm. from Tarkovsky's father, Arseni. But when I, like, when I looked into the into the scenario, 
Because he, he was still alive. Name was, yeah. was, was, he was okay. not there anymore. So, mm -hmm. but the 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 voice is the problem issue in Tarkovsky's movie is very complicated. Like with Solaris as well, we have the Italian uh, version with Pasolini's voice, uh, um, um, and and it's it's very complicated. So I might have I might have uh, like read something wrong about it. It's for sure his. Voice. It's, it's probably part of. I mean, you were mentioned. You were hinted. But it can believe. be since his 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 uh, second wife, his mother, and many other. Characters are played from by people in his own life. It can be that, that his father's voice is with there. There is an element of autofiction, I guess, in Karkovsky's uh, yeah, uh, uh, cinema. And uh, I wonder if that's part of what you were uh, saying at the end about him, about Karkovsky essentially playing a bit this ambiguity of the. Um, the, the, the nature of the Boris Bull or uh, of the world, anyway. Uh, okay, so I am not going to take any more advantage of my position as chair, uh, and I'm going to leave um, I'm gonna leave to the floor if you have any question. Or otherwise, I'll have to, I'll, I'll go uh, questions. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to break the ice with Giuseppe. The yeah. question that I want well, after the question is asked, uh, um, Mahilda. But it's just a very, uh, just a curiosity actually, because uh, you were uh, talking about radio dramas and you were talking about, and you ended with a very, very uh, interesting quote by uh, Conrad, though, which really made me think of Matt says not there. Yeah, uh, about that. Those manipulation strategies that she was discussing, the, the 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 narrator actually telling the reader what to do with the uh, with the, um, with the narrated uh, word. Uh, but anyway, and uh, and Cora at some point says, well, the narrator of the Negro of the Narcissus says, um, can you see it? And you made us see a few images that were very interesting. I don't know why they if if that was a deliberate choice of having. Uh, moving images while listening to radio drama saying if they were in any way related to your uh, to the topic of the uh, of your talk or were you just trying to distract us <laughs> it's a device <laughs> no in the sense it was just to break the boredom of uh, just listening and showing something that was yeah. waving around the sense and uh yeah, i didn't Actually, had a second thought about the, the effect it might have on, on, uh, on you. Mm -hmm. I was just uh, developing the PowerPoint. Yeah. So okay. it was more an aesthetic choice than an hermeneutic choice. Okay. Um, well, I have a question for Yamila, and a bit for this headphone, I guess. Uh, it's again more of a not a curious, actually, a question. But um, you you started by saying, and correct me if I'm wrong, but Medalepsis happens quite naturally in radio drama. Uh, sometimes you didn't say sometimes. Uh, <laughs> but one thing uh, from your examples and from my experience of uh, sometimes radio dramas, but I listen to podcasts as well. And my impression is that uh, that happens quite a lot at the thresholds of the um, of, of the drama or of the podcast uh, at the beginning or at the end, in particular. Uh, do you find that? I mean, do you and I guess also Giuseppe, if he wants to uh, chip in, uh, do you find that's the case actually, or uh, is that just? <laughs> Well, what I was referring to is, uh, if you look at metalepsis from the sort of structuralist perspective as a transgression of narrative boundaries, then that is something we see quite a lot when you look at the, the various sonic channels that we have, that you have transitions from the extra diegetic to the intra diegetic level or the other way around, okay? So this kind of blending over uh, from, from one level into the other, um, especially in contemporary drama, that is done quite frequently. Um, but the question is, do we really want to call this already metalepsis or if we take into account this uh, idea of disruption and the disillusionment that comes with metalepsis, then of course we would have to discount these examples because they actually 
function in a very un unobtrusive way in radio drama. I mean, listeners barely notice, or if they do, then it's just the way that this is designed. Um, I guess what you're alluding to is when we move from the introductory announcement into the, the radio play world, uh, and here we indeed often see interesting or hear interesting um, uh, yeah, transitions or mixes of levels, because oftentimes at the moment when, say, an announcer still relates what's to come, we already have music come in, we already have um, a certain sonic tapestry that begins. Uh, and likewise, in the end, you know, the, the fading out where you usually get the list of actors and producers and everything, um, th that can be tied into the ending of the, the actual radio play. So in that sense, we do have interesting um, fusions or mergers, but again, do we want to call them uh, metalepsis or is it just an aesthetic playing with, you know, the possibilities of sound that you can actually have those transition points and thereby maybe uh, make the opening slightly more interesting or exciting. Um, so I'm not entirely sure how exactly we want to define metalepsis in radio drama. Okay. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you. The world of the words is actually divided in two parts. So mm -hmm. we have the first one, which is the most memorable one, because that's where uh, we have the presenter that introducing uh, Orson Welles as the the director of, of the Mercury Theatre. Then he goes on and reads the part of the of the beginning of um, of, the, of the actual book of Orson uh, H. G. Wells. Uh, Justin makes another thing which is quite significant in there, he puts us in the context. Uh, so that he says by the end something like, today at this moment there are several millions of, of listeners. So we are, again I'm using that expression that I use in, in my paper, we are swallowed in his world in there. And uh, I didn't know about how he, what, Interesting maybe also to mention that all the effect that it had on Ozins is because radio is doing radio. So it's doing the, the, the things that every normal afternoon, Sunday morning program would do. So band room, music from the band room downtown in, in, in New York. And then uh, the announces on, on, uh, on about the, the weather. And then it goes back and forth up to the point in which we have at the end the description of the of the actual work, and they would someone saying, "Is anyone out there? Is anyone out there?" And then we have the announcer saying, "This is the end of the first part." We have the break, and then the second part is actually more classical in a sense and forget well, forgettable, if we may say that, because uh, actually in that case we have just the. Um, the, the, the main protagonist, the main character, which is the astronomist, that is one of the survivors and speaks about uh, the world that is what, restarting. So uh, just like, as in H.E. Wells, he approaches the, the monsters, then he realized they are dead or they are dying. And that world that they were creating by destroying hours was out. Um, there is another play which goes in a similar way, well, not in being deceptive, but in reenacting the radio in the play, and this is again an adaptation, and this is an adaptation in the 50s by the same company, the, the, the CBS, and it's the uh, Jack London, the Scarlet Plug. Mm -hmm. Scarlet Plug is, well, rather, it's, it's a really uh, an adaptation, so we have a process of cutting, pasting, and transforming the, the story. But what is interesting is that radio is represented in the, in, in the, in the radio drama, uh, doing again what the radio, the radio did as a, as a unique device at the time, uh, puts people in contact with the world. So they, the radio was talking about the, the plague spreading around in the world. And um, 
and every contact they had with the world outside was through the through the radio through the system which uh, brings me to another uh, radio drama this one is written by Simon Armitage and is the draft of the of Medusa that was actually uh, developing on a story that Derek uh, Jarman uh, was thinking about about uh, what producing as a, as a filmmaker, but he couldn't because uh, because of the illness he had. And um, and in this radio drama, which is again an apocalyptic one, in that case, it's not the flood that is destroying the world. It's uh, it's um, a float. So the UK is submerged by water, and we are on a Medusa farm. And the only news this two person that live in there uh, have is through the radio, a battery they their radio. So they got this this message from from the from the government saying that nothing is changed, stay at home. And uh, but it was recorded in the end. So they were listening <laughs> to nothing at all. Fantastic. Uh, thank you, Giuseppe. It's great to hear uh, um, how you uh, emphasize the fact that Orson Welles would play the expectations of the listeners of the radio. Uh, yeah. from, yeah. from uh, here. I, I enjoyed all of the three talks very, very much. Um, and um, well, my guest is basically first by Yamina, that's also for Giuseppe. Uh, <laughs> both spoke about how they play, the radio play was actually enacted within. <laughs> radio play isn't just mise en avis. You know, you said you're not sure what the definition of epileptics would be in radio trauma. So I wonder, perhaps, is this actually a mise en avis rather than a, <laughs> you know, an epilepsis? You mean when the when the author um, appears in the play? Yeah. Well, I mean, Giuseppe was saying. Uh, that the, the play was enacted, and rather than dream, it was enacted, then the play, uh, the, the, the uh, displays were uh, uh, framed uh, at the beginning and at the end. Uh, uh, and uh, so this is, perhaps I misunderstood something, perhaps I needed clarification, uh, but isn't there a strong element of peace on that being? You say to yourself that you're not sure what the definition of uh, epilepsis would be in radio drama. Mm. Well, mise en abîme, to my mind, would be slightly different because then you'd have a sort of replication of what's at one level within the the lower level and perhaps even further down, right? Um, and um, examples that come to mind here. In another medium now, uh, I noticed that with picture books for children, that oftentimes you have a picture book and then within uh, one of the, the panels, you will have um, the book itself, okay? The, the very picture book that we're looking at is there somewhere where in the scene, placed somewhere, and I would see that as a typical mise en abîme, where you have um, a sort of mirroring down of one item at one level, and then within that, okay, so embedded um, at various levels. But with the example uh, of um, the War of the Worlds is slightly different because we have this transition from the real world where Orson Welles, as the real Orson Welles, starts out talking. Um, and it's only after a while that we realize, okay, he's now no longer announcing anything or talking to the radio audience, but he's actually citing from the original novel. And then he, he goes back to the, the other level um, and taking us back to reality, uh, you know, indicating that this is a radio uh, broadcast, okay? But then uh, all together we have the broadcast, well, okay, if you want to look at it that way, the broadcast within the broadcast, that would perhaps be an Abim construction, but at, in a very loose way, okay? So it's an imitation of what radio as a medium itself does. Um, and this is then exploited to create a, a very strong illusion about what listeners are 
hearing, okay? The illusion that what they're listening to is not a constructed radio play, but just a regular radio program that has all these different elements that I mentioned earlier and that Giuseppe also mentioned that we have this news anchoring and breaking news and then we have music intermissions and so on um and this is uh, you know listening to that you're given the illusion as if you just listen to a regular radio program but of course it's all part and parcel of the construction of this radio play and uh, and it's then only later on um, broken through when we realize right so the events that are presented here that can't be uh real um but Ms. Beam, i don't know for me that would be would have to include more specific elements that are sort of doubled at the the various levels of the radio play i'm not sure about that okay cool. thanks <laughs> and then just one other quick i particularly like also the uh, kind of uh, the uh, take a lot as you can see between the wall off and and the non uh, verbal elements there. I think it's an extraordinary uh, example of the of the Thank you. For the, the spatial temporal world of the voice and the, in the, and then you add other of the, the images are uh, disconnected. And I think that's Really, thank you. Thank you. But that's a very, a very strong element of Tarkovsky's movies. Yeah, all yeah. along his career, he's mm -hmm. very much uh, thematizing the problem of, like, also yeah. of natural temporality and technical temporality yeah, yeah. in a way that he tries to sort of uh, create um, an illusion of natural temporality yeah. by showing at the same time very explicitly yeah. that he's doing it through the mm -hmm. technique of cinema no, so right. these two levels are very nostalgia are there other filmmakers who do the same thing well i'm i'm not an expert uh, either in narratology or in the yeah, film yeah. study so <laughs> I, 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 I have to think about it but, but yeah i'm i'm, 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 I'm pretty sure there are yeah. at least people that have taken from Tarkovsky some yeah, elements yeah. and then like develop them in another mm -hmm. way. Do you know who I think took some elements from Tarkovsky in a context oh, yeah. which is completely different? Mm -hmm. Landsman in a show. Oh, crazy. Really? <laughs> Real. Yes. There are some sequences in Shaw by Landsman where you can feel the quotation and yes. the idea of shaping time through a very specific representation of space, it's all about how to say a present which cannot be present anymore, but in a way should remain present in the um, memories of those who uh, experienced such a tragedy as the Holocaust. So the, oh, the entire movie is about how to find a way to play with temporalities and to describe a present and present qui n'en finit pas de finir. Et donc, qui se réactualise sans cesse. And then there's a quotation, there's an image, a very specific image where you can feel the quotation of Tarkovsky, which is, of course, a Jose Lapin, because you cannot say you're quoting Tarkovsky if you're doing something like Schwa, at least until the end of the, the 90s. And then when, when you can say it, you don't want to say it anymore because you're a landsman, but you can see how That's Tarkovsky nice. was important in that work. That's super interesting also because, like, usually we connect Tarkovsky to, for example, Lars von Trier, his, like, first example I have in mind, but Europa. this is a very, yeah, that is also a very, like, easy and, way of coping yes. or imitating in landsman. You have so many other like other yeah goals also to achieve mm -hmm. and the the voice of question or the voice of issue is also very present but in another like there i i feel uh more of a there's an there's a concept in in literature and in philosophy i'm not very uh, acquainted to is akuzmat of course and this way this idea that also in ancient philosophy you used to uh to take classes philosophy classes from philosopher in pythagoric philosophy uh at least from philosopher you you would never seen you would never see them but you would take their um their knowledges and their teaching 
without like but only by listening and this tradition has has been developed very much and very much in the way of documentary and témoignage uh, of course uh, and and also what what you're saying in my opinion is really important because in in in, in Shoah, for example there's another thing that you cannot identify who's speaking yeah, yeah, and you have a variety of voice off in, in the movie so there, and that's also really really interesting um yeah, but if I'm not mistaken, a colleague of yours, uh, Malcolm, uh, si, wrote si. a very interesting them. essay about <laughs> that. Of course, <laughs> she's one of my best friends. <laughs> okay. <laughs> because I, I, yeah, read, yeah, I, I, read, I read her, that. I read her, actually, so. it's super interesting. She, okay. She's the one who, she, who, she's who, the one who, who told you about the the concept. Concept. <laughs> At least the Akusmatu one. <laughs> no, and she's all, she is also a, a very interesting scholar in in the in our perspective, which was your perspective yeah. today, because she tries to use right. um, a variety of notions taken from uh, movie um, studies, discourse, yeah. movie studies, to try to see if you can apply yeah, it to literature with the same terms or categories, and then she goes back to movies after having uh des enquêtes dans le cadre littéraire. So it, it's really interesting what she does, especially with all chant. Yeah. But not only with that. No, no, uh, just... Your example is really, really in okay. <laughs> I, I yeah, I wonder if you can find another example in the Nouvelle Vague. I mean you can um, I, I think if you're looking for examples in the analysis, <laughs> <laughs> the way, the way to go. Uh, having said that, I think we, we are right. Like, conception, conception would be a relative kind of uh, uh, eclipsis. Yeah. It's not as plain as generality. It's yeah. uh, really levels of the But doesn't it always stay within the movie? Right? Yeah. So when you're um, in Inception, right? Like, uh, no, no, exactly, exactly. But I mean, it's never in terms of Mr. Trump. I know we need a new term, as Yermila, of course, was saying. <laughs> uh, it's, as far as I can remember, it's never about breaking the fourth wall in Inception. It's always a uh, uh, I think. Okay. Okay. Uh, Antonio, can you ask a question in English if I say it in French or Italian? Yes, or, uh, I just wonder, we, know, we, we, because have I mean, we are, we are an hour and 30 minutes later. Yeah, but it's fine. <laughs> no, it's just fine. <laughs> Italian. Italian. I mean, I know I'm a honorary organizer now. No, it's clearly we can do it. Entrambi, uh, Giuseppe e uh, Daniela, eh, una cosa che ascoltando, però vorrei dirla bene in inglese, yeah, non sei più capace. Una, una cosa che abbiamo pensato ascoltando è che quando tu ricevi un discorso, per esempio, attraverso la radio, ne è successo anche con la televisione a un certo punto, inevitabilmente lo ricevi a casa tua. Quindi già c'è una forma di, di, di dispositivo che si mette in gioco che dal punto di vista della ricezione ha un effetto sulla percezione che puoi avere di eh, figure retoriche o strategie discorsive di tipo metalettico, no? Cioè, questa, forse ne avete anche parlato, io devo mettere che con l'inglese a volte perdo delle cose, però que questo elemento è importante, no? Nel, nel, soprattutto si tratta di fantasmi, Il fant abbiamo parlato di fantasmi, anche lì è un'entità che uno associa a delle cose intime forse anche, cioè nello spazio domestico puoi avere a volte l'impressione quando hai perso qualcuno devi trovare in casa la traccia di questo qualcuno e questo cortocircuito ha secondo me qualcosa di, di interessante anche rispetto alle frontiere di cui si parlava ieri tra metalessi esperienziali tra mille virgolette verso cui si dirigeva Marco Bernini e metalessi nel senso davvero narratologico del termine. Ok. Thank you, Guido. We're going to try and make it very simple, but I think what, what Guido was, uh, was asking is that um, when you're listening to a radio drama, um, you listen to the radio drama from the, your domestic space, essentially. And that's very much linked to the intimacy of certain uh, elements that might haunt you, right? That might haunt you, um, personal memories, uh, feelings, troubles, uh, reasons for, you know, being upset, and all this phantasmatic, uh, phantasmal, I think you can also say, fears that uh, can haunt you and uh, are 
very intimate. So I wonder, I mean, what Rita was wondering, uh, through me, so channeling, that's also very uh, phantasmatic uh, way of asking a question, I guess. Uh, if this, um, if the, the, the domestic space in which you um, listen to radio dramas can affect this yeah. sort of uh, relationship, I, I hope I was clear, I don't know if I will. So, yeah, maybe. Is that so, yeah, Yamina yeah, first, maybe? Or is that well, I, I, I think that what no, I'd like to say is that uh, okay, radio has been until the, the, the small transition, the tra uh, transistor has been created, an household device. And so it has always been considered as, house, as a household device. And, and that's true. The, the, the radio was bringing messages to your home and your own personal space. And uh, besides, it is also sort of a thematic element. So you have the speakers, but actually, he doesn't speak, he creates something. Mm. Even if sometimes when you listen to the radio, you watch the radio at the same time, or you do the things that you have to do at home. Uh, but at that point, I don't think, in my experience, I, I, I found that um, studied from, from the perspective you were suggesting. Mm. Has always been studied from a sociological perspective, from the history of the media perspective. Uh, so that's why I wanted to uh, to, to, uh, to answer first, so that I know <laughs> from Yamila. <laughs> yeah. I don't think it's going to go far. There, wrong. Was, there was actually a reason for being good. <laughs> <laughs> <All right. laughs> I think it's a very, very interesting question. Um, nowadays, this is further complicated by the fact that people can essentially listen to radio drama anywhere because usually you can have it on your ears as well, you know, with earplugs. Um, and people will have it through the phone and you can have it while you jog, you can listen to it while you're driving in the car, um, just any situation. And this intimacy that you alluded to that uh, in the olden days when people were listening to radio meant that they gathered in the living room usually where they had their one radio sitting there. People would sit around that and listen to this also in a very communal uh, setting. Um, this has changed again to something that is more individual, but even more intimate, because now we carry the sound in our ears, okay? So it, it has actually intruded our bodies in that sense. And I think for the technique of metalepsis, this creates some interesting possibilities because the eeriness that often comes with metalepsis, I mean, you know, the surprise moment when you realize, oh, here we have some transgression, something, uh, you know, that disrupts the narrative and so on. Mm, that can perhaps be even more powerful because of precisely this intimate listening situation. Um, and I'm thinking of, of the kind of genres that I mentioned earlier, fantasy, ghost stories. Um, these things are really used to great effect and, and part of of the effect that's created has something to do with this intimate listening experience okay the the audio positioning in your head um and uh, yeah so i think that's really a very important question thank you thank you from guido as well uh, <laughs> Uh, okay, we are really running late now, so <laughs> I'm going to thank our speakers once again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to give you like two minutes and a half. <laughs> but let's also thank our organizer. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank see you. you. See you tomorrow. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. 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 Oh, yeah, but... No, 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 no,
tutta la sua calma però già quando mi stai dicendo che c'è è un enorme problema però sì ci sta mettendo una
Ci siamo avanti con i tempi, l'unica cosa di cui non ero preoccupato. Facciamo tutto il contrario. Io avevo dimenticato, esatto, anch'io, la presa ci ripenso. Non c'è nessuno che ci sia. Non c'è nessuno che ci superato le, 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 le 16 ore adesso faccio il foglio Guido faccio moderare Guido stai giocando col suo cioè così sono fresco a fare le domande invece vedi che bel che bel dialogo che c'è stato con, con lei e, e con Giuseppe e con Matilda bella io ci vuole un momento per essere chiudere anche il powerpoint dovrebbe essere ancora aperto per dare un quindi però domani a posto sì, ma poi, poi però devo andare a testi a tutte le persone perché devo moderare il scenario guarda è una carriera che devo cercare poi comunque sono una persona molto moderata Adesso per per ricompensarmi di tutto quello che ho scritto per i 10 minuti. Per i 10 giorni. 
Cominciamo questa ultima sottosessione del, del pomeriggio in italiano, come avete potuto intuire, eh, con eh, il contributo di eh, Giuliano Cenati, che è professore associato di letteratura italiana all'Università Telematica Pegaso, ha eh, conseguito il dottorato in ricerca all'Università di Milano sotto la guida di Vittorio Spinazzola e... Eh, ha insegnato, ha fatto, fatto dei postdoc, poi insegnamenti a Milano tra il 2003 e il 2000, uh, 2018. Uh, si è occupato di un gran numero di autori, otto e novecenteschi, ma in particolare mi fa piacere citare uh, Alberto Savinio, Clotero Lucentini e Juan Rodolfo uh, Wilcock, di quale parlavamo giusto appunto qualche secondo fa, e in particolare come pubblicazione ha curato l'edizione uh, L'edizione di scrittori liminari della modernità italiana, dagli scapigliati a Luigi Capuana, Massimo Montempelli. Eh, varie monografie, tra cui Torniamo a bomba, i gripizi narrativi di Vittorio Imbriani, eh, disegni di vizze e fulmini, i racconti di Catamilio Gadda, e frammenti e meraviglie, ancora Gadda, e i generi della prosa breve. Eh, oggi ci parla di fumetti, quindi andiamo ancora verso un altro eh, medium. E fumetti 3D, illusionismo ed euristica della metà diegesi, verbo visiva. Poi vediamo già qualcosa nella presentazione. Sì, 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 sì. Sì, sì. Ci sono persone a distanza, perché vedevo solo, solo gli account del seminario. Adesso si possono venire registrati. Ah. Molte grazie ad Antonio Bibò per la presentazione, moltissime grazie per la magnifica ospitalità a Luigi Cuccia, a Françoise Lavocat, alla Sorbonne Nouvelle. Buon pomeriggio. Desidero proporvi una ricognizione sull'uso e le funzioni della metalessia in ambito fumettistico, con riguardo soprattutto alle vicende del fumetto italiano tra gli anni 80 del Novecento e il tempo presente. Si tratta di una fase storica di sviluppo del medium che muove dalla stagione delle riviste e dei piccoli abiti tascabili distribuiti in edicola alla stagione del graphic novel in formato librario distribuito in librerie e fumetteria 
in particolare nelle librerie generaliste, dove il fumetto non è raggiunto prima se non in forme assai limitate e parziali. Se in Francia la BD ha voluto da lungo tempo di adeguata legittimità culturale, in Italia la frattura estetico-culturale tra una produzione popolare e una produzione colta è potuta essere ripensata e superata solo in tempi relativamente recenti. Al volgere del secolo, con l'affermazione decisa del fenomeno graphic novel, ciò non significa che vengano meno le ragioni di una distinzione tra settori e tra livelli di produzione e di fruizione dell'opera fumettistica, ma che le diverse modalità intrinseche all'opera di impostare il rapporto tra lettori e autori conoscono un reciproco avvicinamento. Ciò vale d'altronde anche per le relazioni tra l'esperienza di lettura fumettistica e altre forme di lettura letteraria, sullo sfondo di un sistema mediatico editoriale improntato ai principi della convergenza, dell'interazione contestuale tra diversi media e della rimediazione. Io penso che la metalessi, o per meglio dire l'evoluzione delle sue funzioni all'interno del racconto fumettistico, possa essere assunta come marcatore di tale processo di transizione e integrazione del fumetto entro un sistema mediatico più plastico e dinamico rispetto a quello tipicamente del novecentesco. Certamente la metanessi alberga nel fumetto sin da quando esso manifesta in modo conclamato tratti di comunicazione di massa a scopo di intrattenimento, cioè dalle sue origini ottocentesche. Quando il fumetto si propone come esperienza di lettura divertente e disimpegnata, la metalessi può ben figurare nell'armamentario compositivo, più orientato a finalità ludiche e spassose, in sintonia con la piega scherzosa o fantastica dell'approccio al racconto. Ne abbiamo testimonianza in un'opera come Royman di Tiziano Slavi di Attilio Micheluzzi, pubblicato nel 1987-88 sulla rivista Comic Art. Tiziano Sclavi è l'ideatore e lo sceneggiatore di uno dei successi popolari a fumetti più notevoli di fine Novecento in Italia, vale a dire Dylan Dog, l'indagatore dell'incubo, si è rimensile pubblicato dall'editore Bonelli a partire dal 1986. Sclavi introduce e amplifica in Royman un estro per la citazione metalettica, per l'eco e l'incrocio intermediale tra letteratura, cinema, arti figurative, del tutto analogo a quello che vi spiega in Dylan Dog la disinvoltura del passaggio tra un livello diegetico e l'altro, tra un mondo possibile e l'altro, appare condotta sino all'iperbole pirotecnica, al cortocircuito giocoso e reiterato tra dimensione narrativa e finzione narrata, appunto da chiedersi se la concatenazione metalettica abbia valenza immersiva o immersiva, se sia il personaggio eponimo dello sceneggiatore a calarsi nel mondo di finzione fantascientifica da lui ideato, o siano i mondi della sua fantasia a emergere nella dimensione di realtà cui egli appartiene in quanto scrittore e sceneggiatore. Il punto di partenza è la prospettiva predominante conforme al punto di vista del Royman uomo comune e addetto editoriale suggeriscono la direttrice prevalentemente immersiva, intrametalettica della rappresentazione. Fatto sa che la stratificazione dei mondi possibili percorsa attraverso i carrelli elevatori della metalessi suggerisce una tridimensionalità della narrazione che fa tutt'uno con la sua versatilità e la sua ricchezza di risorse immaginose. Stavi introduce e amplifica in Groyman, scusate, il, il modello principale a cui Sclavi si rifà in Groyman è fornito dal romanzo What Mad Universe, assurdo universo in italiano, di Frederick Brown del 1953, in cui la teoria degli infiniti mondi possibili trova applicazione a carico di uno sceneggiatore di Pulp Magazine a tema fantascientifico. Il processo metalettico di incertezza cognitiva che grava sul protagonista Royman lo espone costantemente all'interrogativo sottinteso in quale degli infiniti modi mi ritrovo, ma la consonanza tra le vicende e le proprie invenzioni di sceneggiatore conferisce al protagonista uno speculare vantaggio cognitivo che gli permette per lo più di decifrare le mosse dell'avversario e sbrigarsi da ogni impaccio. Il 
diversamente da parecchi fumetti impostati sul dualismo tra mondo dei sogni e mondo della veglia, nessuna convenzione grafica suggerisce quale sia lo stato di realtà rappresentato, onirico o reale. Il lettore è chiamato a riconoscere dalla singola tavola o vignetta per collocarla opportunamente nella gerarchia dei mondi e dei livelli di realtà o di consapevolezza rappresentati. Il meccanismo del sogno ricorrente si incrocia e si travisa presto, ad ogni modo, con gli effetti di un detonatore metalettico dotato di parvenza ben concreta e quotidiana. Una caffettiera che esplode al confine tra mondo diurno e mondo onirico in corrispondenza del risveglio o presunto risveglio di Royman. Importa sottolineare come Sclavi lascia intendere di saper utilizzare la metalessi sia per le più scanzonate scorribande fantascientifiche, sia per inscenare un attacco militare degli Stati Uniti d'America contro se stessi, New York contro Hollywood, in quanto oggetto di una strampalata storia di guerra sollecitata a Royman dal capo della Wonder Comics, l'azienda editoriale per cui lavora, sia per illustrare in senso claustrofobico, in senso claustrofobico di ripetizione dell'esistenza, che suscita risonanze tra Pirandello e Bergman. L'opposto di Sclavi e Micheluzzi, ma negli stessi anni Ottanta, Art Spiegelman andava elaborando con Maus il memoire individuato come prototipo per eccellenza di un nuovo realismo nell'ambito del fumetto, a partire dal quale si, si sarebbe consolidata l'affermazione del graphic novel. Il realismo paradossale di Maus passa anche per meccanismi di modera moderata metalessi che illustrano il divario e insieme il necessario collegamento tra il mondo autorappresentato dell'autore e il mondo riportato del padre Vladek Spiegelman, protagonista del memoir e testimone dell'esperienza concentrazionaria di Auschwitz. L'attenzione prestata al farsi dell'opera depone a favore dello statuto documentario e testimoniale, non funzionale, perseguito da Spiegelman. Disegnare gli strumenti della rappresentazione fumettistica, le tappe e gli intoppi della composizione, ma anche i bozzetti intermedi, permette a Spiegelman di tematizzare la faticosa ricerca della giusta soluzione compositiva, del necessario equilibrio attraverso cui coltivare il racconto dell'olocausto a fumetti in un'impresa inconcepibile, dato lo status pregiudizievole del medium. In Maus c'è spazio, ad ogni modo, anche per una metalessi più impressionante, che potremmo chiamare, qualificare come metalessi mediale. E la sovrapposizione ai disegni dei documenti e delle fotografie d'epoca di un ritratto fotografico di Vladek Spiegelman. La cesura improvvisa del tessuto fumettistico causata dall'emersione di una fotografia vale non solo a ribadire il fondamento biografico documentario della vicenda raccontata, ma anche per contrasto a rimarcare la strategia compositiva adottata dall'autore. Mediante la fisionomizzazione animalesca delle categorie etnico-nazionali. Se gli ebrei sono rappresentati come topi e i nazisti come gatti, il varco metalettico aperto dalla fotografia segnala che quel topo collocato al centro del racconto, esemplare della topizzazione quattro imposta dalla persecuzione, era davvero un uomo. E' per giunta un uomo dotato forse di uno strano senso dell'umorismo se al termine della prigionia decide, decide di posare presso lo studio di un fotografo indossando un uniforme da campo nuova e pulita, per avere una foto ricordo da inviare alla moglie Ania e comunicarle così la propria sopravvivenza. Siamo al paradosso della vittima vera della Shoah, che riveste i panni fittizi di vittima, che diventa cioè narratore fotografico di se stesso, in quanto vittima, ma vittima sopravvissuta, mediante una messa in scena fotografica per evocare ed esorcizzare lo sterminio appena scampato. Il divario tra media, fotografia e fumetto, possibile di essere giustapposti e correlati entro una medesima composizione romanzesca, viene sfruttato estesamente da Ausonia, Fiorentino Francesco Ciampi, nel 2008. 
come un romanzo, un metaromanzo, quanti romanzi a fumetti intitolato Interni o la miserevole vita di uno scrittore di successo. Anche in questo caso si tratta di un travestimento allegorico di gusto kafkiano, in cui le fisionomie e le vicende umane, in particolare quelle dello scrittore Albert Grunwald, sono proiettate in forme entomologiche, sullo sfondo di una Germania stravolta dal nazismo e dalla guerra. Il registro di rappresentazione è però stavolta apertamente finzionale. Grunwald è vittima di un complotto del suo editore che intende legarlo perpetuamente alla produzione di genere più dozzinale. Ma interviene in suo soccorso la segretaria di redazione Anna Sherwood, che gli permette di smascherare la persecuzione e portare in tribunale i suoi referenti editoriali. Di lì in poi per Albert Grunwald si apre una stagione di rinascita intellettuale in cui dedicarsi al romanzo di levatura colta che sta scrivendo e riscrivendo da una vita, dal titolo Interni, in zona Bim. Il riscatto del scrittore, non esente da imprevisti, trova corrispondenza nel faticoso dopoguerra della Germania, sul piano pubblico, e in una terapia contro la prostatite sul piano privato. Proprio lungo gli imprevisti del percorso intellettuale di Grunwald, ex scrittore di successo, Ausonia, in questa sequenza divergente del racconto realizzata mediante la tecnica del fotoromanzo. Una certa sospensione riflessiva della narrazione è attuata grazie alla sovrimposizione di didascalie autoriali. Confusione di metalessi metaromanzesca, metalessi retorica, nel dato sinistro della pagina. Mentre l'introduzione di dialoghi fotofumettistici tra la voce fuori campo dell'autore e il suo editor mentale, metalessi ontologica o finzionale, determina una continuazione della metalessi di Dascarica con altri mezzi assai più invasivi. L'editor mentale si presenta come un signore elegantemente vestito con una scatola di cartone al posto della testa e la in cresciosa attitudine ad abitare in affratti edilizi dell'apparenza poco ospitale. Ci danno anche momenti di civile conversazione svolta con la voce fuori campo dell'autore su uno sfondo intimamente salottiero. Il dialogo tra editor mentale e voce d'autore assolve la esigenza di motivazione della vicenda primaria, quella di Grunwald, ma poco a poco anche della vicenda metadiegetica. La funzione eulistica, dispiegata dal confronto cerebrale tra l'editor e la voce autoriale, assume un andamento insieme saggistico e narrativo. Il contributo della tecnica fotoromanzesca conosce ulteriori manifestazioni in interni, perché oltre alle sequenze metalettiche di cui il protagonista è l'esito mentale, insieme con la voce d'autore, dalla vicenda di Albert Grunwald si diramano anche sequenze incentrate sull'incubazione della storia primaria, dove Albert e Anna, niente affatto scarfaggi antropomorfi, presentano fattezze umane giovanili esaltate dal realismo dell'immagine fotografica. Ma sul piano psicologico e motivazionale appaiono personaggi appena sbozzati, brancolanti nell'incertezza del proprio progetto esistenziale e della relazione reciproca. Un ulteriore livello metadiegetico allestito da Ausonia riguarda gli amici dell'autore, che sono coinvolti in una campagna fotografica in Sardegna, funzionale alla realizzazione dell'opera. Accanto alle battute di dialogo che coinvolgono la solita voce autoriale fuori campo, alla stessa maniera in cui essa interloquiva con l'edito mentale, si trovano battute che tematizzano e ricercano sul senso della metalessi a partire dal film di Woody Allen, Whatever Works, e a partire dalla trovata alleniana di far rivolgere il personaggio di Boris Yelnikov, protagonista del film, al pubblico in sala. Il problema è che non c'è una sala e non c'è un pubblico in sala, secondo gli amici di Eusonia, perché hanno visto il film a casa loro sul supporto digitale, una cosa che consuona con quello che dicevamo poco fa a proposito della fruizione radiofonica nel salotto del, soggiorno, del, del proprio appartamento oppure in tempi, in tempi correnti con gli auricolari in qualunque ambiente ci capiti di frequentare. La metalessi extradigetica incentrata sui mezzi e le circostanze materiali di fruizione patisce insomma, le trasformazioni tecnologiche intervenute. 
per passare a occuparci di racconto a fumetti non funzionale, dopo il precedente modello di Spiegelman, ci rivolgiamo a Zero Calcare, che offre nel 2015 una delle interpretazioni più efficaci del graphic journalism con Cubane e Colin. Reportage disegnato al seguito di una missione di solidarietà internazionale verso la città siriana durante l'occupazione di Daesh. L'aspetto didascalico del reportage è arrivato da continue fibrillazioni del registro rappresentativo che virano il fumetto in chiave umoristica e autoironica. Le discontinuità dell'esposizione, all'interno di cui si inseriscono destruttoriamente dubbi, chiose, precisazioni, riflessioni collaterali, mostrano spesso le valenze formali e strutturali della metalessi benché l'impianto dell'opera non sia propriamente di finzione e le ragioni dell'artificio romanzesco si pongono ad ogni pagina e con esse le opportunità del loro sfalsamento metalettico. Lo stesso registro di Dascalico ammette discontinuità di tipo meta di Dascalico, come nel caso dei pipponi o spiegoni, please detect, che indugiano a chiarire determinati aspetti della situazione geopolitica e politico-culturale, o nel caso dell'infografica scherzosamente applicata all'autoanalisi interiore del narratore-autore, o nel caso delle note di traduzione che compaiono per evocare il disorientamento e il genuino smarrimento nel contatto interculturale, pur animato dalle migliori disponibilità comunicative e al confronto. Posso da reporter o addirittura da esperto che sa le cose perché le ha vissute sul campo riesce malagevole a zero calcare il suo personaggio autoriale in veste di reporter e qualora che gli accorgimenti metalettici valgono a ironizzare la superiorità didascalica del mio scrivente o io fumettante attraverso una sua esasperazione e caricatura e si spingono fino a esortare il lettore a non leggere quelle strisce, a saltare bellamente quelle strisce che si soffermano su noiosi e pedanteschi ragguagli. L'interiorità trepidante del reporter manifesta eccessi di turbamento così spinti che ne scaturisce nel pubblico un'empatia divertita. Il tipo di metanessi che esprime tale condizione interiore è quello che giustappone vignette cronachistiche a vignette in cui si proiettano ossessioni e incubi ispirati dalla fama sanguinaria di Dash, anzitutto. L'ordinaria sintassi della tavola disegnata non solo prevede l'accostamento tra i diversi piani di realtà, quella esteriore, resocontistica e quella psicologico-introspettiva, ma per giunta quest'ultima appare sottoposta a procedimenti di similitudine iconica, esumendo il termine di paragone l'immaginario mass mediatico di intrattenimento che più estraneo non potrebbe essere rispetto al contesto bellico turco siriano. La propaganda del terrore di Daesh, per esempio, ammette il paragone con i cattivissimi punk dell'anime Okuto no Ken. Il manichismo virulento del cartone animato post-apocalittico giapponese ben consente di misurare le semplificazioni della comunicazione politica in base alle distorsioni dei mass media ufficiali. Talvolta il piano di rappresentazione che coincide con la divagazione introspettiva o commentativa, come in questa diapositiva la drammatizzazione polemica attribuita a George Pig, per appello della più nota Peppa, appare in stridente contrasto con il piano di resoconto principale appunto che gli interlocutori reali del protagonista reporter afferenti al piano di resoconto principale per proseguire la conversazione devono richiamare l'attenzione del personaggio protagonista per distoglierlo dai piani di rappresentazione collaterali e devianti Zero Calcare si può considerare rappresentativo di un ampio filone non solo italiano del graphic novel e del graphic journalism in cui uno spazio di racconto centrale è riservato al personaggio autobiografico dell'autore. L'autodiegesi autofunzionale o l'autodiegesi didascalica non funzionale limitano fortemente in linea di principio il ricorso alla metalesse, perché postulano la collocazione sulla scena del personaggio autoriale, in figura e o in voce, 
in un ruolo decisivo e come portatore del punto di vista dominante. L'impianto del racconto simile, d'altronde, potrebbe essere inteso come estensivamente metalettico, proprio in base alla presenza persistente del personaggio autore, alla sua caratterizzazione in termini di cartoon, all'effetto di dissidio e convergenza tra io narrante e io narrato. Soprattutto quando la consistenza dell'intero mondo narrativo gravita intorno alla molteplicità di ruoli e funzioni assegnate al soggetto autoriale, la metalessi e gli scossoni cognitivi che essa produce ribadiscono la sovranità di quel soggetto. Si tratta delle ritirate manovre di messa a punto del processo narrativo o espositivo attraverso cui le scelte di composizione vengono esplicitate, chiamate in causa problematicamente, ribadite, sottoposte all'attenzione critica consapevole del lettore allo stesso tempo in cui al lettore si prospetta e si ribadisce la sovranità del protagonista, narratore, autore. L'illusione della piena funzionalità narrativa, dell'efficace sintonia tra la cosa e il racconto che la rappresenta, è così revocata in dubbio a favore dell'illusionismo metalettico che mostra l'artificio della narrazione e sollecita tuttavia il lettore ad appropriarsi dell'artificio, ad ammetterne la legittimità, perché conoscere gli utensili del mestiere narrativo, diventare un po' lui stesso autore, significa predisporsi a una migliore comprensione della cosa che quegli utensili consentono bene o male di rappresentare. La connotazione illusionistica ed euristica che la metta lei si assume nel fumetto, a testa, mi pare, la maturità artistica ed espressiva raggiunta dal medium, la rivendicazione e la consapevolezza di autorialità professata dai suoi esponenti più significativi, il superamento di quelle incertezze di riconoscimento che hanno gravato a lungo sul medium, in modo speculare, ben inteso, a Metalessi nel fumetto contemporaneo attesta che un'analoga sicurezza e consapevolezza nell'accostarsi al medium sia stata acquisita dai lettori, senza la cui corresponsabilità e complicità, ovviamente, non c'è Metalessi che funzioni. Grazie. Grazie, grazie Fede eh, Giuliano. E, ok, so now we are going to, I'm going to give you very good news. So we're going to listen to the next paper and then the Q&A will actually happen in outside here if I got it right. We don't know. Uh, no, after this. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Okay, sorry. After this paper, we're going to be tuning outside uh, while drinking cider and being a lot more relaxed and while the performers actually get ready because there's a performance after this. Okay, thank you. 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 Thank Comia, Coco, Marta Merlino, Elena Rubà, Franco Villamar Ruiz, Sara Vaia, coordinate, uh, well, coordinated by uh, Fabrizia Malgeri from the University uh, Ulm Milano, which is, of course, as you know, one of the co organizers of, the, um, of, of this seminar. Uh, will to talk about another medium that we haven't uh, talked about yet, which is video games. So, with a great title as well, uh, which is Don't Forget to Save Your Game, a reliable metalectic narrator in the video game Doki Doki Literature Club. Fantastic. The floor is yours. Thank you. <laughs> Okay. 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 Okay.
Okay, so um, our research analyzes uh, metalepsis in video games. We will be taking uh, a look at, that, at this topic, basing ourselves off of the study made by Ryan on uh, metalepsis uh, in this medium, which ties in with the interactional metalepsis, an expression further analyzed by Anslin that exploits uh, the interactive nature of digital technology. Uh, we will continue uh, with the case study of uh, Doki Doki Literature Club, uh, a visual novel, a video game produced by King Salvato and published in uh, for free in 2017. Uh, this video game uh, apparently isn't different from any other dating simulator video game, uh, with a name of more pro protagonist that finds himself hanging out with four female members of his school literature club. Uh, but I won't get into any more specifics as you will hear about it uh, in the second part with my colleague, uh, Marta. Okay, um, Ryan uh, emphasizes the importance that metalepsis can have in video game by stating that uh, video games offer a particularly favorable uh, environment for metalepsis. Uh, as programs that produce fictional worlds, uh, they can play with world and core levels and as well as that invite the player to step into the shoes of a character or the avatar, uh, they can exploit the contrast between uh, the player's real and uh, fictional identities. Um, therefore, from this statement, um, we can infer um, uh, that Ryan's consideration of metalepsis in digital media is extended by the concept of interaction of metalepsis. Um, Anslin defines it as a phenomenon that primarily involves digital interactive media that requires the user's physical interaction with the hardware and, uh, and software. Therefore, interaction of metalepsis uh, explores the interactive nature of digital technology um, through, uh, through, the, through the hardware, um, with which the player access the game, such as uh, the mouse, uh, uh, the keyboard, or other navigational devices. Um, it is thus fundamentally in embedded and an inevitable feature of uh, video games. Um, it is also important to highlight that since interact interactive metalepsis uh, um, in uh, video game media depends precisely on the player in the player's interaction with the video game um, and the associative narrative work while playing, uh, we have to consider a particular kind of ontological transgressions that occur across the boundary between the real world and the fictional and the narrative world, rather than um, the ontological levels within the narrative uh, world itself. Um, also, um, it is um, most obvious and common, um, commonly accepted that metalepsis causes confusion or at least surprise, uh, because it marks a break between what are normally perceived as strictly separate ontological spheres, uh, but in, in the same way, and it is particularly in um, in digital media, uh, metalepsis is used, it can be used to achieve the opposite effect, uh, which is uh, to increase immersion. For example, uh, in video games, uh, the player is drawn into the fictional world uh, in different ways. Uh, for example, uh, with the use of you, uh, when game character or the game itself uh, addresses the player, or by seeing the game world in 3D from the first uh, person perspective, uh, for example, in uh, first person shooters kind of video games. Um, uh, lastly, uh, avatars can be uh, described as the most arguably, it can be arguably the most immersive metalactic tool, um, precisely because uh, they give players the opportunity to project themselves physically and graphically into the world of, of the story. Um, therefore, the player uh, who is also identified as an avatar descends from the extra detective world to act within the, the story world. And in this case, metalepsis does not disrupt the illusion of the fictional world, but on the contrary, 
it is not the narrative levels to immerse the player with, uh, within uh, the fictional world uh, itself. So, um, uh, in this way, the, the player, uh, when playing, playing a video game, al almost no longer uh, perceives the artificiality um, of the game uh, itself. Um, uh, analyzing the role of the mouse in human computer interaction in general, uh, Bizzocchi and Woodbury suggest that we are so accustomed to this correlation that we, we don't even question we don't even question it thus. Uh, while ontologically transgressive, transgressive uh, the player or the cursor can also be seen as a form of conventional and naturalness in digital context. Uh, having a visual perspective uh, controlled by a peripheral navigation device uh, um, as an established and conventional feature of, uh, of video games. Um, okay, lastly, uh, a particularly significant element to analyze when it comes to metalepsis in video games uh, is the connection between the diagesis and uh, non-diagesis. Diagesis referring to being in the world of a video game's narrative action uh, that is juxtaposed with non diagesis, uh, non, yes, non -diagesis. Um, and the non diagetic element of a game that exists outside the world, uh, such as menus, head up play, displays, or settings. Um, and as, it, as we have already mentioned, um, in, it is common in a video game for the diagetic boundary to be transgressed uh, by the way players during the act of playing constantly oscillates uh, between the inside and outside of the diagesis. Um, Galloway um, further uh, suggests that metalepsis does not only refer to the disruption of diagetic boundaries, uh, be because it is also connected to the um, oscillation of authority between the player uh, and the game uh, he or she is playing. Uh, whether it is the game's control behaving unexpectedly or the player <coughs> altering the game's code. Um, he argues that both the player and the game itself uh, can perform acts in and out of the diagesis, um, and this is articulated into two, dis two distinct axes, diagetic, non-diagetic, and operator machine, uh, and identifies that both the player operator and the game machine function perpetually inside and outside the diagesis, uh, with the player performing acts within the game world while at, at the same time manipulating menus or the HUD that are overlapping but exist separately. Um, therefore, video games also alternate between acts within the diagesis, such as playing scene or controlling enemy, uh, enemy behavior, or non-diagetic non acts, such as changing the HUD or character statistics. Um, concluding that the oscillation of diagetic and non-diagetic elements uh, and between the inside and outside uh, of the story world uh, is a key part of a video game uh, and thus creates a tendency towards uh, metalepsis within, uh, the, within the medium. Um, therefore, uh, considering Ryan's, asser Ryan's assertion, video games provide a favorable environment for metalepsis, uh, not only because they can play with fictional world and full levels, uh, but also because they can or play with the diegetic and non-diegetic element uh, of a video game. Uh, and this makes metalepsis a uh, meaningful, meaningful consequence to the way video game diegesis function. And we will see this, uh, we will see a great example of this with, uh, with our case study, Doki Doki Literature Club. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to talk about our case study, so Doki Doki Literature Club. As said by my colleague, it is a video game published by Team Salvato in 2017, and it is a visual novel dating sim video game. So uh, a visual novel video game means a video game that uh, uh, relies mostly on text to communicate its, uh, its story. So the player can click to advance through uh, the lines of text, and uh, he, uh, they can also uh, click to select uh, through multiple choices and play a minigame, in this case, to uh, choose, and here we fall in the dating sim part of the definition, which one of the four girls, in this case, will be the uh, romantic interest of the protagonist to the story. 
the plot of Doki Doki is pretty simple. The protagonist is a boy who joins his school's literature club and there he meets the other four members. And for the first uh, three days of narration, this is pretty much uh, what happens. Until on the fourth day of uh, narration, uh, something changes. So uh, the protagonist discovers the suicidal body of one of the, the girls, Sayori, and something kind of weird happens. So there are some uh, errors on the screen. And uh, the game forcefully goes back uh, to the um, to the main menu where the save files are uh, corrupted. And when the child, when the player tries to load them, the game for forcefully starts a new game where everything goes uh, on uh, like normal, except for the fact that uh, everything behaves as Sayori had never existed before. And so the game. Uh, uh, let's uh, its facade fall and uh, reveals itself as a psychological horror video game that relies on metalepsis to um, create a sense of dread in the player and most importantly to create a sense of unreliability on all levels of uh, narration. So, um, Sayori's death scene is already... Um, oh, sorry, I forgot the part. Um, the main point of the game is that uh, one of the girls, Monica, the brown-haired one, is uh, fully conscious of being a character in the game and uh, is um, constantly altering the game code in an obviously non diegetic act to become the only girl left for the protagonist to date. And the Sayori's death scene is already a perfect example of how she acts. For a while, under um, in the in the background, we can see a message. An exception, an exception has occurred. See trace back point DC for details. And the player can actually go into the game files and find the file trace back point TXC. Opening it, you will find the usual error messages, but also a message that uh, we can see in the in the yellow post-it that. Uh, is already a hint, a non diegetical hint about uh, Monica's, uh, Monica's hacking the, the code. And uh, this is not the first time that uh, she uh, leaves uh, some hints. For example, in the first act of the game, before Sayori's death, uh, she reminds the, the protagonist to don't forget to save your game, which is something she shouldn't be aware of. And uh, um, during uh, the game, uh, on the second act mostly, so after Sayori's death, many other uh, kind, of, many other errors and uh, glitches begin to happen uh, during the story. And uh, these are all examples of, um, of how Monica is slowly altering the game and how she is working on a fine line between diegesis and non-diegesis. Uh, so looking at these errors, it is, uh, it is uh, useful to um, Pick on, the def pick on the definition uh, uh, created by Cooper of Jank. So Jank is a mixture of bugginess, minor glitches, uh, and any other number of possible occurrences of abnormalities that usually don't cause frustration, but rather enjoyment, amusement, even character to a game. One example is in The Witcher 3, when uh, the player calls for his horse. Uh, sometimes the horse can uh, appear on the roof of a house. So it's uh, a nuisance, but a funny one. And uh, Schmalzer takes this definition uh, and applies it to game controls. So a janky, uh, co janky controls are control uh, are create a disconnect between input and expected output. And uh, jank can be unintentional, so literally an error in the code, or like in this case, intentional. And usually, intentional junkiness is uh, used to uh, create a sense of unreliability on uh, the, um, the gameplay level, or most importantly, uh, they can give the player a sense of loss of control. And uh, this uh, is what happens once again on Sayori's death scene, because the player loses control of his directives. Directives are, are all the um, actions in game that have an influence outside of the edge of diegesis. So for example, setting the game, creating, uh, um, going back to the main menu, skipping a dialogue, opposed to commands that are 
for example, uh, uh, actions like uh, picking a uh, dialogue option that have an effect on diegesis. And uh, di directives uh, are naturally operator actions, uh, as defined by Galloway, so actions that the player does, uh, as opposed to machine actions that uh, are uh, whatever action is uh, executed by software and hardware. And so during uh, Sayuri's death scene, it's the game that sends the player back to the main menu, and it's the game that forces the player to start again, to start again a new, um, a new game, a new, yeah, new game. And uh, those are all directives that uh, should be operator actions and that the game forces to be machine actions. And um, the, this uh, kind of, uh, of uh, incongruence uh, reaches its peak uh, during the end of Act 2, when another one of the girls uh, perishes in a pretty violent way. And uh, at the moment, the player is uh, stuck uh, be uh, beside her, uh, her body for two in-game in -game, uh, days, while uh, the only thing uh, they can do is uh, proceed through gibberish text. They cannot uh, save the game, they cannot uh, load a new save file, they cannot do anything else than uh, go on. And um, at this point also, the player and the protagonist uh, are kind of, in some way, overlapped, because while in Act 1, the text uh, uh, relied also the inner thoughts of the protagonist. Uh, this uh, has slowly ceased to happen during Act Two, and um, at this point uh, it has stopped uh, happening. And so the player is pretty much alone. He can't uh, anymore. He can't hear the thoughts of the protagonist anymore. And uh, this brings us to the distinction between uh, this. This brings us to the thought that the protagonist isn't actually the best indicator of the player's will, since uh, he does uh, participate in the story, but uh, and he is named by the, by the player, but in fact, uh, the player can choose when and what he will say, when, when and what he will, when, will he, when, when he will talk, or uh, where he will go and when. Uh, he can just influence him. And so, in a way, the real indicator of the player's will is uh, the mouse cursor. And this is interesting because uh, the mouse cursor, the, prota the protagonist, uh, as his avatars, we can say that the protagonist is the is, is di is diegetic avatar and that the mouse cursor is, is not diegetic avatar. The player and the machine, all put together, create the Gestalt cyborgian entity that uh, Kyo uh, defines uh, as uh, what is created when a player plays a game in an almost uh, uh, symbiotic relationship. And it is interesting also because Monica um, manages to, uh, to influence the mouse cursor itself in a scene where uh, the player has to choose which girl to, to the protagonist should help in, uh, during the festival. Uh, the mouse cursor forcefully moves on Monica's name and he can't choose anyone else. And this gives the player the sensation to almost be controlled himself uh, outside of the DHS, it's almost in the real world in some way. And uh, this reaches its peak in the third act of the game uh, when Monica actually succeeds in her attempts, uh, when uh, she deletes uh, every obstacle between her and the protagonist, uh, or to better say, her and the player, since uh, she's uh, now alone in a room, uh, let's say, in front of him. And uh, she calls the player by, in a way, their name. She uses the name uh, that's saved on the computer in where, uh, where the, the player is playing. And she refers to the protagonist as that you in the game. At this point, the player cannot uh, uh, use any directive. He cannot skip Monica's dialogue. He cannot save when he attempts to do so. A, uh, it, uh, a message appears saying, there's no point in saving anymore. I'm not going anywhere, obviously, said my Monica. Uh, he cannot even go to the main menu, so he cannot uh, load or save or do anything like that. And the only way the player can free himself from this situation is by playing Monica's game. So going uh, in the game files, once again, non diegetically and deleting uh, Monica's character file, character file from the game uh, in uh, reaching in doing so the game's finale. So, the thing we found uh, interesting uh, of Doki Doki Literature Club uh, is that uh, 
Metalepsis is uh, usually uh, applied to create a sense of immersion. For, exa for example, at the end of Act 3, the circle, the, metal, the, the, the border, circular border that um, contained the diagesis expanded to uh, encapsulate the player in it. The player was at the point a part of, uh, of the diagesis. Or to create a sense of, alien of alienation, uh, creating a sense of uh, uneasiness that uh, tend to, uh, that tended to um, make the, the player have, um, want to have a distance between themselves and the game. And Doki Doki manages to do both things simultaneously. So it uh, forcefully draws the player in by manipulating him, manipulating the directives, and at the end uh, re uh, referring to him directly. But at the same time, with uh, his sense of dread, with its sense of dread, with uh, all the all the horror and things like that, uh, it makes the player want to distance himself from it. But uh, they actually can't. And this is pretty much it. This is our bibliography. And uh, oops, thanks for your time. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, um, as announced before, I think, yeah, I think I thought we were just I don't know. I'm not the organizer. <laughs> so, I mean, Guido, the last thing I heard from Guido was that we have to go outside for the QA. So, I don't know what you want to do. But I'm going to ask you, maybe you start a conversation and ask me. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much. That was super, super interesting. Uh, I have just one small question that doesn't have much to do with metal analysis. And um, it would be, can you call a game, if I understood correctly, at the end, a player cannot do anything, like it's forced to do, to just cancel the game. This is the very last action you can take. If you, can, you can just close the game, open it, obviously. And uh, it, it does not have to cancel the entire game. It just has to cancel the, to, to delete uh, car uh, Monica's character file. Obviously, it is not the real character file. The game is structured in a way in which uh, the player can mm -hmm. alter some files, uh, obviously prepared by the programmers already there for him to, to play with, in a sense. But then, like, inside the world created by the game, we cannot do anything else. You so can just stay there and watch Monica. Would, would, mm. would this still be considered a game? Like, how how far <laughs> is this? It is interesting because okay. uh, there are similar games that uh, uh, made uh, many people uh, ask the same question. For example, uh, uh, everybody's gone to the Raptor, where uh, the player just walks around. It does it does nothing as then walking around, exploring an area, and finding uh, sometimes some uh, like letters or. Uh, um recordings uh, made by people uh, uh, which can help him to um, understand what actually happened in the city where, where. here can he walk around or he's just he can just uh, like listen to what monica has to say so it's um, it's rather a movie with with like in with some way movies. but it's it's just like uh, it is in a way a level so to let's say win the level to pass to the to go to the next step so act four in this case yeah, he has to he has to do something to to uh, to overcome an obstacle and the obstacle and the obstacle in this case is outside of the diagesis so is to delete the file mm. Very thank you thank you very much <laughs> There is no way to avoid the, the suicide of Monica, and I would like to know if there is any connection between the fact that she knows that she's a fictional character and the suicide. 
yeah, she states she personally states that she uh, to make the protagonist distance himself from the other girls. Uh, at first, uh, Sayori was already a bit. Uh, 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 she had depression, and Monica depression, and Monica through the code made it worse. She didn't want her to actually die. She just wanted her to uh, distance herself from the from the protagonist. And in fact, uh, in the um, in the comment she does when Sayori dies, she says. Uh, um, she says, actually, you know what? This would be probably a lot easier if I just deleted her. She's the one who make it, who's making this so difficult. So she tries to do it in a peaceful way, but at one point she says, it's easier like this. I don't care. She makes her killing herself. Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> and the same goes for the other, uh, for the other girl that... Uh, is uh, in a pretty similar way. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's kind of it's quite violent. Yeah, she's kind of messed up. Yeah. I can, uh, in Act Four, she kind of thinks about that and she says, "I have, this was a bad idea. I am a bad person. I am sorry." And she kind of she kind of tries to uh, to make to fix things uh, in a way in act four which is later on and uh, it was not uh, useful for our case so we didn't talk about it, about it much okay yeah, yeah. um what is the uh, okay Non, non le vedo opposte tra loro queste due possibilità, cioè nel senso che la metafora dell'immersione comunque prevede, non lo so, un uh, tuffarsi, come vogliamo, come vogliamo chiamarlo, in un mondo che è stato creato da qualcun altro apposta mm -hmm. per noi. E quindi ci sta che la, relazio la, la reazione del, dello user uh, sia inizialmente quella della, uh, diciamo, del, della, del, della, della relazione, dello straniamento, quindi forse è, è una fase più avanzata no? del gioco, uno inizia a capire uh, i, i meccanismi, cioè eh, almeno nelle prime fasi io penso che la relazione sia, sia normalissima quando ci si mette in, in un mondo, in questo caso parliamo di un mondo, totalmente nuovo che è stato creato opposta per noi quindi ehm, cioè non, non so il rapporto tra queste due cose come, come lo vedi male forse, forse non, non ho colto io sì, sì. Allora, che, sì, sì, ma, eh, diciamo che i videogiochi di base sono strutturati in una, in una maniera per cui l'immersione è necessaria poi come ho detto prima diciamo che è abbastanza normale diciamo, questa correlazione tra ad esempio mouse e, e appunto lo schermo per cui quasi non percepiamo questa distinzione e quindi quando diciamo, giochiamo ad un videogame è l'effetto principale che viene creato per cui eh, più che alienazione si può parlare di immersione e la particolarità di Doki Doki è proprio che il fatto che sia un continuo salto tra l'uno e l'altro è un scudo tra, tra tutti e due per cui no, appunto ci, ci si è immersi nel videogioco, ma allo stesso tempo proprio perché crea queste sensazioni, diciamo, forti, per cui appunto, ad esempio, quando Monica prende il controllo, si ha la percezione proprio di, di, di questa preparazione. Esatto. Okay. Posso chiedere se è un videogame? Sì, no, allora, nel momento in cui la, ogni singola volta che allora, sia sul sito, sia ogni singola volta che viene aperto il gioco, appare proprio prima di qualunque altra cosa una schermata che dice questo gioco non è adatto ai bambini o chiunque sia, diciamo, insensibile, influenzabile facilmente. Sì, 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 sia sul sito che all'inizio del gioco ogni singola volta e ti fanno addirittura proprio accettare, cioè ti fanno mettere una spunta, sono conscio, ho letto questa cosa, voglio procedere col gioco. Sì, no, da fuori non, non ci si aspetta, esatto, è abbastanza... È esatto, è molto, molto curvo da quel punto di vista. Esatto. 
Non so se ci sono altre domande anche per Giuliano Cenati, per il contributo precedente sui, eh, sui, sui fumetti. Guido, immaginavo che si chiama Maus, però una cosa che vorrei proporre, se siete d'accordo, è la, è la seguente. Visto che eh, c'è la performance in chiusura della giornata di oggi, e visto che i performer avrebbero bisogno di una ventina di minuti per preparare e allestire il locale, eh, se siete d'accordo ci possiamo sedere fuori e proseguire al sole, ma proseguire davvero con il tempo nel tempo che abbiamo preso il sole. Io ho veramente una serie di domande. Anche io. E ho anche una serie di domande. A porco è uno o uno. Ma mi sono scappato. Ma mi sono scappato. Ora, ora, sta scaricando. Ci vado anche a respirare. 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 Ci vado anche a respirare.